Buenas tardes, everyone. My name is Carlos Manchaca, and I am the chair of the Immigration Committee. Today, we are meeting jointly with the Committees on Government Operations and State and Federal Legislation, chaired by my colleagues, Council Members Fernando Cabrera and Andrew Cohen, respectively. This is an oversight hearing on the City of New York's preparations for the 2020 Census to get us a complete count. Today, I'm proud to also act in the, my other role as co-chair to the Council's Census Task Force. Along with my co-chair, Councilmember Rivera, I have been looking forward to today's hearing for months. I hope to have a fruitful and engaging conversation with our partners in the mayor's office and the leaders across the city who see this work as critical for well-being, the well-being of all our New Yorkers. If our city's population is undercounted, if we are undercounted in the decennial census, political representation and millions of dollars in federal funds could be lost. Importantly, New York City is especially at risk of an undercount because of high concentrations of historically hard to count populations. And areas considered hard to count when the self-response rate in the past census was below 73%. Researchers have found that populations that are most likely to have low response rates have common characteristics. They are often immigrants and people of color, non-English speakers, renters, certain religious minorities, and very young children. In New York City, we have large populations of historically hard to count populations. While each population has unique reasons for failing to complete the census, I look forward to hearing today from mayoral administration leaders and the members of the public about how collaboration with government, community-based organizations, and the private sector will bolster our efforts to ensure a complete count for New York City. As chair of the Immigration Committee, I have been particularly interested in the fallout from the White House's failed attempt to include a citizenship question on the 2020 census. The question was on an attack, the question that came from the White House was an attack on localities such as ours that are stronger because we have a diverse population here and we know that he was targeting cities like ours. While we won that fight in the courts and there is no citizenship question on the census, we believe much damage has already been done. Fear is tangible throughout our immigrant communities and citizenship, the citizenship question or not, people are terrified of one more government agency knocking on their door and asking for personal information. I cannot stress this enough. An undercount is one of our hard to count communities and it will be terrible for the entire city. An inaccurate census of just a percentage point or two represents millions of people not counted. In this powerful and inspiring city where local laws have made it impo or I should say, where local laws have made it possible that immigration status is not a barrier to accessing city services, we need our immigrant communities and really all our hard to count communities to complete the census. We need to show the federal government that we are here and that we do exist and that we are entitled to the political representation and funding that is our due. It is with this in mind that the speaker created the Council Census Task Force, which is mobilizing council members to ensure complete count throughout the city, as well as working with community-based partners in the mayoral administration to reach out to the hardest to count communities. In the most recent budget, the task force co-chair, Councilmember Rivera and I, fought for, and gratefully the city council, the BNT specifically, was able to secure the 40 million towards a multi-prong effort to ensure complete count in the 2020 census. I wanna thank Julie Menon and her staff at the NYC Census 2020 who have been working alongside our task force throughout the entire summer to ensure that this funding is invested in hard to count communities to guarantee a complete census count. We are so grateful to, the, to be partnering on this project with such a dedicated team of civil servants. Today's hearing is just one of several ways in which the task force is conducting oversight on census efforts across the entire city. It is critical that we get the planning right. 
so that come spring 2020, our networks are activated to respond to this questionnaire. I would like to thank the committee staff for their work on this hearing, community council, Har Harbani Auja, policy analyst Elizabeth Kronk, and my staff for their work on this, including my, uh, including my staff, Chief of Staff Lorena Lucero, and my Director of Communications, Tony Chirito. I will now turn this over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Menchaca. Good afternoon. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. And before I read my statement, I want to uh, thank my co-chair and Council Member uh, Rivera for the, your dedication. I know what it is to be in a task force. Uh, I was in a gun violence task force, and it takes a tremendous amount of time and commitment. And I know you already have very busy lives as it is, so thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Beginning in March 2020, the U.S. Census Bureau will launch its constitutionally mandated effort to count every person living in the United States. However, as this hearing will make clear, efforts to ensure a complete and accurate count of every New Yorker are already well on the way. The consequences of an undercount in New York could not be more serious. Among all the important uses, census data determines New York's representation in Congress and determines how hundreds of billions of dollars of federal dollars will be allocated to states. However, the 2020 census represents several unique challenges for New York. The census will be the first to be administered online, meaning most households will need access to a computer with internet to compete, complete the census questionnaire. While there are more than 200 languages spoken across the state, the Census Bureau provides language support for only a fraction of these languages, leaving it to local government and community-based organizations to pick up the slack. And local, and local census efforts will need to overcome negative and uninformed attitudes about the census. In addition to certain communities' fears of interacting with the government, polling reveals notable Differences in knowledge of the census among different income, economic, and age group. In the face of these and many other challenges, the mayoral administration and the city council have proactively invested in ambitious get out the, the count efforts. As Council Member Menchaca said, the council secured a total of 40 million in the fiscal year 2020 budget. The mayor created the NYC Census 2020 office to lead the city's census engagement strategy. It is vital that trusted local voices are the ones encouraging census participation. That is why of that 40 million secure in this year's budget, the council set aside 14 million to go directly to community-based organization, four million of which has already been allocated to selected CBOs to develop planning and capacity building resources for the city's coordinated census strategy. The remaining 10 million was joined with 9 million from the mayor to create the New York City Complete Count Fund, a competitive grant to fund additional CBO census outreach. The city also allocated 1.4 million to libraries to help bridge the digital divide created by, the first, by this first online census. Today's hearing will explore how these funds, all the city agents, agency resources and relationships with CBLs, the private sector, and philanthropy, among others, are being leveraged to ensure that all New Yorkers get counted. I would like to thank additional staff whose work made this hearing possible, Committee Counsel Daniel Collins, Pol Policy Analyst, analyst Emily Forjohn, uh, and Finance Analyst Masses Sarkinsia, and Sebastian Baki, as well as my own legislative and communications director, Claire McLevin. I will now recognize Chair Cohen. That is me. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Cabrera and Menchaca. Good morning. Uh, I'm Councilmember Andrew Cohen, Chair of the Committee on State and Federal Legislation. As my colleagues just outlined, the stakes could not be higher for New York City in the 2020 census, and I am eager to hear what the administration, the state, and stakeholders on the ground are doing to ensure we get a complete count. I want to come back to the importance of the census for political representation. The census determines how many congressional representatives 
each state gets in Congress and, and <clears throat> informs how states draw, draw locality, and localities draw district lines. New York State has been losing population and congressional representation for decades. Many predict we could lose up to two congressional seats after the 2020 census. New York cannot afford to lose representation in Congress. The city's representation in Albany could also be affected, and we want to make sure the city is fully represented at the state level. As the chair of the State and Federal Legislation Committee, I also want to highlight an important player in 2020 census preparations, New York State. To date, the state has been behind the city and other large states like Illinois and California, which appropriated 80 and 100 million to their census efforts respectively. By contrast, New York, state, New York State's budget included $20 million statewide uh, to census efforts, but we have no idea how those funds will make their way into communities get out the count effort. The state's Complete Count Commission recently released a report in which it identified several challenges to achieving an accurate 2020 census in New York. However, the report makes no specific recommendations for how the $20 million should be spent. This effectively punted the question to the governor. We cannot afford to wait. New York cannot afford an undercount. I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Menchaca and Rivera, for their leadership on the 2020 Census Task Force, as well as Councilmember Cabrera for his leadership in chairing this important oversight hearing with us. I'd also like to thank my policy and budget director, Patty and Trader, for her work in this hearing and the rest of the staff in getting us ready for today. I will now turn the mic over to Councilmember Rivera for an opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am Councilmember Carlina Rivera, co-chair of the Council's 2020 Census Task Force, and I want to thank the chairs of the respective committees, Chairs Cabrera, Cohen, and Menchaca, for holding this long-awaited hearing today and for giving me the opportunity to speak briefly. As co-chair of the Council's 2020 Census Task Force, one of the most critical roles we play is providing oversight over our city's multi-layered preparations for the 2020 Census and ensuring involved city agencies are operating at peak performance and our city is ready for a complete count. Our city is certainly stepping up to tackle the ambitious task that lies before us all. It is not an exaggeration to say that the future of countless state and city programs, political representation, and even our democracy rely on a complete and accurate census count. To achieve this complete count, our city has forged deep partnership between the mayor's office, the council, CUNY, the public libraries, and community-based organizations across the five boroughs. But a campaign of this scale requires more than just committed partners. That is why, following the speaker's creation, the Council Census Task Force, myself and my task force co-chair, Councilmember Menchaca, went to work and fought to secure $40 million in funding for our complete count efforts in the 2020 Census. In the months ahead, our task force will work with council members to help educate and mobilize individuals in their communities, as well as work with CBOs and the mayoral administration to ensure we are reaching our hardest to count communities. More than half of New Yorkers in the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn live in these hard-to-count neighborhoods, in addition to specific neighborhoods in Manhattan and Staten Island. These areas may be hard to count based on large populations of young children, people of color, foreign-born, low-income household, limited English-proficient communities, or frequent movers or other factors. While new changes to the census process, such as the form being online, will present new obstacles for counting New Yorkers, it's the same challenges we faced before that may make reaching hard to count New Yorkers the most difficult. Fear and mistrust of government, which was stoked by our federal administration and its failed attempt to add a census citizenship question, has only grown in hard to count populations. Today's hearing is an opportunity to allay that trust and hear about the proactive steps the city is taking to ensure every New Yorker is counted. I am excited to hear about the best practices in community-based outreach, the NYC Census's 2020 plans for getting out the count, and much more. The answers we receive will also help ensure our city council appropriated funds are being used for maximum impact. 
I want to thank Julie Menon and her staff at New York City Census 2020 for their work and partnership with our task force since the beginning of the year, particularly for the funding ag agreement that we reached to support our census outreach efforts. And I am also looking forward to how we can really include the diverse student body of New York City and at the City University of New York. Their presence here today shows a continued willingness to engage and be open about this very important process. And I look forward to hearing their answers to our questions and from everyone else set to testify before us today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Rivera. And uh, we've been joined today by Councilmember Ben Kalos and Councilmember Karen Kozlowitz uh, from Queens. We, let's just get started. Uh, welcome to the administration. We will have a uh, swearing in before you speak. If you could raise your hands. Mm -hmm. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Yes. Please introduce yourself before you speak. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll introduce um, our team here. So good afternoon, Chairs Manchaca, Cabrera, and Cohen, and co-chair of the Census Task Force Rivera. I am Julie Menon. I'm director of the Census uh, for New York City, and I'm also executive assistant corporation counsel at the City Law Department. And I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Amit Baga, our deputy director, as well as several members of our team, including Kathleen Daniel, our field director, and Kavita Pari Sanchez from the New York City Census Office. So first of all, I want to thank the Council Census Task Force and the three committees for providing us the opportunity to submit testimony today uh, on such an important issue facing the future of New York City. I also want to recognize, as was stated before, um, the historic and unprecedented partnership between the de Blasio administration and the New York City Council with respect to the development, in particular, of the New York City Complete Count Fund, which is a first of its kind $19 million grants program that will resource community-based organizations across the city to engage in census-related education, outreach, and organizing. In particular, we really want to express our deep thanks to Council Members Menchaca and Rivera for co-chairing this task force. It's been an incredible partnership, and I really want to thank them for their outstanding efforts, as well as the staff of the Council's Finance Division, Government Operations Committee, Legal Division, and many others for their dedication to this effort. And we really hope that this model of partnership uh, will serve as a paradigm for many, many years to come on other issues as well. So as we can all agree, the 2020 Census is arguably one of the most important civil rights issues facing New York City. Our fair share of over $650 billion in federal funds that are distributed annually nationwide for public schools, public housing, infrastructure, Medicaid, senior centers, and so many vital programs that New Yorkers uh, rely on are at stake, as well as potentially the loss of up to two congressional seats statewide. Such a loss would not only deprive us of our rightful representation in the House of Representatives, but also, of course, have repercussions in the Electoral College as well. Given all that is at stake, and given New York City's historically low self-response rates, it's imperative that we achieve a complete and accurate count in the 2020 Census. We must surpass our 2010 initial self-response rate, which hovered at 61.9%. That is obviously significantly lower than the national average of 76%. The self-response rate for many communities, including the African-American, Afro-Caribbean, as well as the Orthodox Jewish communities in particular, hovered at 50% and oftentimes significantly lower than that, with some neighborhoods having self-response rates in the 35 to 40% range. Areas with low self-response are much more likely to experience an undercount and be denied critical resources as well as political representation at the city, at the state, and at the federal level. This is precisely why um, Mayor de Blasio announced the creation of NYC Census back in January. Our goal is to ensure that in partnership with community leaders, grassroots advocates, elected officials, the media, libraries, hospitals, and others, New York City is 
able to fight for our rightful share of both resources and representation. With a focus on census-related education, organizing, and messaging, NYC Census is the first such initiative of its kind in New York City. Our budget of $40 million represents the largest such investment by any city in the country and stands in stark contrast to 2010 when the city did not allocate resources for outreach and, and messaging in this regard. So the de Blasio administration committed $26 million of the total, with the remaining $14 million being contributed by Speaker Corey Johnson and the New York City Council. We are deeply grateful to the Speaker, the Council, and the Census Task Force Chairs, Manchaka and Rivera, for their supporting commitment. And we are so proud to be leading this unprecedented partnership between the Council and the administration. I'm now going to provide a brief overview of the importance of the census, what's at stake, and why the 2020 census has such a unique landscape. So as we all know, the census is mandated by the U.S. Constitution, requiring, of course, that a, there is a census conducted every 10 years. Such a count has been happening since 1790. Since its earliest days, the census has determined the number of seats that each state is allocated in the House of Representatives, and therefore, of course, the Electoral College as well. Additionally, census data is oftentimes used to determine shapes and relative size of congressional districts within each state. Given that there is significant overlap between these populations and those that have been historically undercounted and populations that have been forced to live on the political or socioeconomic margins of society, achieving a complete and accurate count in every census is critical to ensure that every person has full access to the representation that they deserve. In addition to determining relevant political representation, the census, of course, is used to determine how over $650 billion in federal funds are allocated for critical programming, including those to support public education, housing, infrastructure, and more. Turning specifically to the 2020 census, it is worth noting that next year's census differs from past censuses in two key ways. It will be accessible, first of all, online and via the phone, I might add, because that is oftentimes overlooked, but via the phone as well. Um, and then secondly, the fear and disinformation tied to the nearly two-year-long conversation about the citizenship question has created enormous challenges to participation. And of course, it, it bears noting we are thrilled um, that we won the citizenship case and New York City Law Department was a plaintiff on the case along with the Attorney General's office, but we have a lot of work to undo the damage that was wrought by the mere scepter of asking the question. Additionally, here in New York City, we face some specific challenges that exacerbate some of the issues created by the 2020 census. These include historical barriers to census participation, our immense a de demographic, cultural, and linguistic diversity, the unique and complex nature of our built environment, and of course, the digital divide that has prevented many New Yorkers from having easy access to broadband. So before I provide a more detailed overview of our specific plan, I just want to take a moment to outline the process that the U.S. Census Bureau has shared that they will engage next year in conducting the census. So first of all, the first phase of the 2020 census will take place from mid-March through mid-May of next year, and that's in which households across the United States will have the opportunity to self-respond to the census, either online or via phone. According to the Bureau, no door-to-door -door enumeration will take place during this time. In March, approximately 80% of households will receive a mailing with a personalized code inviting them to participate in the census online. The remaining 20% will receive the traditional paper form. Several reminders will be sent to households to complete the form between March and May, and households that have not responded online will then receive a visit from a federal enumerator starting in early to mid-May. Because self-responding significantly decreases the likelihood that a household will get a knock on the door, and because self-response data is vastly more accurate, our citywide plan is focused on ensuring that as many New Yorkers as possible participate during the self-response rate period. I should note that households can continue to self-respond through the end of the census period, which is currently slated to end in late July or early August. 
Now I'm going to go into our plan. We have four pillars for our plan. So we have built and are continuing to build an approach that we believe in partnership with hundreds of organizations, community leaders, elected officials, business leaders, libraries, hospitals, and thousands of New Yorkers will enable us to successfully address key issues facing New York City. Our program is built on the following four pillars. First of its kind grants program to community-based organizations to engage in census-related education, outreach, organizing, and messaging. That is our New York City Complete Count Fund. Secondly, a sophisticated get out the count and neighborhood organizing field program that seeks to directly engage and organize tens of thousands of everyday New Yorkers on the importance of the census. Third, a multifaceted partnership with government, business, and major community institutions, including the library systems, to leverage their vast and existing reaches to ensure that the value of census participation can be communicated to New Yorkers at scale. And then lastly, fourth, an innovative multilingual, multimedia advertising and marketing campaign that seeks to convey the importance of obtaining our rightful share of representation and resources. So I'm going to now talk about pillar one, the fund. So Should let's pause. Stop? Let's just okay. pause. Right, sure. right there. Um, so, there's a couple things that are going to be um, important to talk about here. Uh, one is just that we don't have a lot of time in this chambers, and so I want to make sure that we can get sure. through all the testimony and then the questions from the council members as well. Yep. Uh, you've laid out the four pillars. Mm -hmm. In in, is there a way that we can just ha have you talk? Summarize them quickly. Summarize them yep. quickly. The four pillars. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes. And so, summarize sure. those. We'll go to the mayor's office of immigrant okay, affairs. Okay, uh, very quickly. Thank you so, so much. the first pillar is a community grants and 19 million dollars um, that we are jointly disseminating between the council and the administration to community-based organizations. I'm thrilled to announce that. Um, uh, based on the RFP that we release, we now have uh, close to 500 groups that have applied for funding, which is really fantastic, and so we're very delighted about that. We have, as you know, what we've worked out very closely with the um, City Council, a uh, selection committee and criteria of which these will be based on. And then, of course, we really want to thank Cooney, who's our partner um, in, and is the administrator of the fund in terms of the great work that they are going to be doing in this regard. Um, then moving forward to our field program, we announced earlier we divided New York City into 245 neighborhoods. We're calling them neighborhood organizing committees, or we're using the term knocks, like knock on the door. Uh, and there as well, we've had a fantastic response to that. We have over 500 people who have signed up uh, just on the website since the announcement to be volunteers on that. We are conducting teach-ins. We're training people to conduct their own teach-ins, um, and that's really been a great model for people to be locally involved in their neighborhood. People can volunteer for an hour, 10 hours, 20 hours, as much or as little they, as they like, but they can volunteer in their own neighborhood and really affect the future of their neighborhood. So we think that is incredibly important. Um, then in terms of our third pillar, which is our partnership with other agencies, we have reached out to every city agency. We are working really closely with all of them. The Department of Education in particular is a key partner to us in helping us to spread the word to parents and children about the importance of the census. Certainly NYCHA, which traditionally has been largely an undercounted community, we are working very closely in conjunction with NYCHA, with DSS, um, with the Mayor's Office of uh, People with Disabilities, Department of Aging. I mean, really, there's no agency that we're not working with because of the various touch points that each agency has. So that's something we're very focused on. And then the fourth pillar is our media campaign. We are really focused on community and ethnic um, publications. Um, and, and we're also very focused on digital. We have a historic opportunity with digital ads because we can have a specific call to action with a click-through where you can immediately see the ad and then answer the sentence is like that. So that's something we're very excited about utilizing. We'll be making an announcement um, later on about our um, advertising and media campaign, and all the ads will hit in 2020 so that we're judiciously utilizing our resources. So I'll stop and see if there are any questions there. Awesome. Thank you. And we're going to come back to uh, some of those pieces in the field programs and really thinking about that through our district office approach. Uh, next, we'd like to hear from Commissioner Mustafi. Hello, 
Um, thank you to Chair Cabrera, Co, and Menchaca, and members of the committee. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner of Mayor Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today alongside my colleagues from across the administration as we work together to ensure that every New Yorker is counted during the 2020 Census. In this testimony, I'm gonna to briefly touch on the context of the census work in this federal climate, highlight the partnership we have with Director Menon and the team um, to reach New Yorkers with the, the message about the importance of the, of the count, particularly, of course, immigrants being our expertise. The census has an enumeration enshrined in our constitution. It is the instrument used to effectively denote resources and representation to states and localities and for our communities. Through it, every person has a chance to be counted as a New Yorker, regardless of their immigration status or language or any other demographic characteristic. Ultimately, this count will be used to plan for the future of our city, and we heard the share of our resources, representation, and more. As such, we recognize the power we wield as individuals, as members of the biggest city in the nation. For that reason, the Trump administration's attempt to undermine the accuracy of the census count is extremely concerning. Over the past few years, the federal government has deliberately attempted to instill fear and confusion in our immigrant communities. The administration, the president, attempted to add a question on the citizenship that thankfully we won uh, to not have included, but this could chill participation by immigrant communities and is reflective of a broader anti-democratic effort to silence immigrant communities and push immigrants into the shadows. In a city like New York City, the ultimate city of immigrants, excluding immigrants and their households from the census count would be devastating. Almost 40% of our residents are immigrants. 60% of city residents are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. That includes nearly 500,000 undocumented New Yorkers. Looking at households, we know that one million New Yorkers live in a mixed status household where at least one member is undocumented. This includes 277,000 children, a majority of whom, 77.8%, are US born citizens. To attempt to erase these New Yorkers from the official count is a naked attack on the city as a whole. But we will not be pushed down and ignored. We know that an undercount of immigrants is not inevitable. To the contrary, in 2010, some immigrant dense neighborhoods, including Washington Heights and Jackson Heights, had self response rates that were significantly higher than the average response rates of the city as a whole. We know that this is because of the work done in the community and with community organizations to do outreach. Through our work with New York City Census 2020, we can improve on the work of 2010 and collaborate with the community to ensure that everyone is counted. Moving to our partnership with the Census 2020 office, the creation of that campaign and the appointment of Director Menon shows that the city is well on its way for preparation. We recognize that the federal government's efforts to sow fear and confusion must be countered with easy to understand information and outreach, including language access for our immigrant communities. With that in mind, Moya is partnering with New York City Census and other leaders in a few different ways, on community engagement, on inclusive and accessible funding strategies, and in communications and national advocacy. I've spoken at numerous community events about the census, starting as early as the spring of 2018. For example, in April of 2018, I participated in a community and ethnic media roundtable with Deputy Mayors uh, Thompson and Director Lago of the Department for City Planning about the census and how the media could help ease fears about the citizenship question. Thanks to the state and to the city, among other partners, that question, as we know, will not be on the census. Moya has participated in many other events since then with partners across the administration in order to provide the most up-to-date information about census. We've also shared best practices and strategies with cities across the nation through our coalition, Cities for Action. This is particularly useful because many of our sister offices in different cities are tasked with the implementation of census outreach themselves. In May of 2018, for example, we met in Boston for a best practice convening where my colleague Joe Salvo from the Department of City Planning uh, spoke about the importance of an accurate count, creating a city outreach office, and how to contextualize the importance of census for individuals. Since then, we've uh, provided an overview of the work of the Census 2020 office, including the outreach campaign, the four pillars Director Menon spoke about, and sharing of key findings from focus groups around marketing. 
We know that a complete count depends on activation of all stakeholders, and that in particular, we must work with community-based organizations in order to reach each and every New Yorker. Given the special vulnerability of immigrant New Yorkers in this political climate, Moya has consulted on Census 2020's RFP process to ensure that groups with deep ties to immigrant communities, including hard-to-reach immigrants, can navigate the process and apply for funding. Finally, we will be supporting the, the Census Office with communications around the Census. Part of that work involves engaging with community and ethnic media outlets, as they're the main source of information for many immigrant populations. We will ensure that we are communicating with hard-to-count immigrant communities through the best medians and in the most effective way. I want to thank Director Menon, Deputy Director Baga, and the entire Census 2020 team, as well as the Department of City Planning for the work that they're doing to ensure every New Yorker is counted. I will end with this. The central goal of the Trump administration has been to marginalize immigrant families and to silence their voices by attempting to deny them the resources and representation they're entitled to. A makeup of America that is at once dishonest and insidious in nature. We know that the census provides some of the strongest legal confidentiality protections available under the country's laws. And further we know and have demonstrated as a city that we're committed to ensuring those laws are upheld. If we have a census that results in our communities under count and a pervasive chilling of immigrants and other voices, the Trump administration has achieved its goal. While the Trump administration continues to push for the exclusion of immigrant New Yorkers and other vulnerable populations from our civic life, we, alongside many others, are working to connect our communities to information about their rights and services. And we look forward to continuing to do this work with the Census Office and the Council. Thank you for the chance to testify about this important uh, topic today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, before Director Lobo, I just want to, uh, my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Cabrera and Menchaca, had to run across the street for a quick vote. They'll be back shortly. And I wanted to acknowledge that we have been joined by uh, Council Members Chin, Drum, Yeager, Eugene, Kozlowitz, and Kalos. Please. Uh, thank you, Chairs Cabrera, Cohen, Menchaca, and Co Chair Rivera, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Peter Lobo, and I'm the Director of the Population Division at the Department of City Planning. <clears throat> the Population Division serves as the city's in-house demographic could, consultant. Could you please a little closer? Yeah, that would be helpful. <laughs> the, or the mic can come closer to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Population Division serves as the city's in-house demographic consultant. It is responsible for the compilation, analysis, and dissemination of census and related federal, state, and local data for city agencies, which enable them to address needs assessment, program planning, uh, targeting and policy formulation. The division works closely with longtime professionals at the U.S. Census Bureau on all technical matters related to the inventory of the city's housing stock and population, and on the local evaluation of national surveys. My testimony this afternoon will deal primarily with the population division's role in preparing for the 2020 decennial census. The Population Division's most important decennial census task is to ensure that the Census Bureau has a complete, housing li complete list of housing units in New York City. This list, called the Master Address File, or MAF, needs to contain a record for every housing unit in the country. To be counted in the census, every person must have an address that is acknowledged by the Census Bureau. If a person's address is not on the MAF, that person cannot be counted in the census. The primary purpose of the, pur uh, the census is to reapportion Congress, which requires that respondents be tied to an address. This information is also crucial to draw various electoral districts. Essentially, for most of the population, the census is a count of people in housing units. Since an accurate map is fundamental for a complete enumeration, Congress created the Local Update of Census Addresses program in 1994. This law gives local governments an opportunity to review, comment on, and ultimately update the map. Several months before Census Day, which is April 1, local governments also have a short window to update the map with any new construction built or projected to be completed in time, of the, in time for the census. 
Since the start of this program, DCP has been the city's technical lead on the MAF and has updated the MAF to ensure that every housing unit in the city is included. In this regard, we have had a long-standing and cooperative relationship with the professional staff at the Census Bureau, both in Washington and in the New York City Regional Office. For the 2000 Census, the first time local governments were allowed to update the MAF, DCP identified over 400,000 housing units that were missing in the MAF. Partly as a result of this work, the city's population topped 8 million for the first time in 2000. For the 2010 census, DCP added nearly 200,000 addresses to the math. New Yorkers and these households would not have been counted otherwise. DCP's preparation for the 2020 census started in 2016 and involved two years of field work and in-office research to come up with the complete count of housing units in the city. We have submitted 123,000 missing addresses uh, to the Census Bureau, and the Bureau has actually accepted 99.9% .9 of these addresses, indicative of the high quality of the submission. Over the past few months, DCP has worked in conjunction with field staff from the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit and the Queensborough President's Office, as well as with private partners Street Easy and Revni, to finalize the list of new apartments at risk of being left off the map. DCP's forthcoming submission of newly constructed housing units that are missing from the MAF will top 100,000 units. Given our role as the technical experts on the census, we've been advising the New York City 2020 Census Office on a regular basis since the appointment of Director Menon earlier this year. This includes periodic briefings on census operations, especially those aimed at obtaining information from fa persons who fail to respond and weekly phone calls to address technical issues that arise. DCP has trained staff at the New York City 2020 Census Office on census operations and procedures and on the changing demographic characteristics of the city's neighborhoods. DCP has also helped NYC uh, Census Office identify neighborhoods that have had low response rate in the past and that are likely to need more outreach in 2020. For each of the Census Bureau offices in the city and for neighborhoods within these jurisdictions, DCP has produced detailed information on the characteristics of the population, including languages spoken in these neighborhoods. In addition, we've been assisting the U.S. Census Bureau's regional office here in the city by providing comments on their field worker training manuals and doing workshops to train their supervisors and managers so that they can better train their field enumerators. I look forward to answering your questions and thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee. Thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm going to start on sort of my area's interest until uh, Chairman Chaka and Cabrera get back. Um, so I'll, uh, <coughs> uh, Commissioner uh, Mustafi, I, I, I am very concerned about the sort of uh, you know, what the state is going to do with their $20 million. Do you have any, uh, any information that you could maybe share with us about what, what you think the state's contribution is going to be to the city and how we're going to work together to try to make sure that we get the best count? Um, so I can certainly speak briefly um, to what I know and then would refer to the state for additional answers. Um, so uh, a report um, that was created and submitted um, by, for recommendation on how the state should approach census engagement includes a few key recommendations, um, including ones that are similar in part to what we're doing here in the city. Um, they include ensuring full activation of city state agencies. Um, I have some awareness that that's already underway with state agencies developing their plans um, and working closely with the budget office uh, around looking at implementation and what the needs are. Um, it includes uh, engagement strategies that uh, are inclusive of community engagement with particular support and focus uh, for organizations and leaders that work with some of the larger undercounted populations um, and strategies to uh, deploy that include communications and marketing, language access, um, among others. So 
Um, those are some of the recommendations that have been put forward to the state and the state budgets office, um, of, of which I have awareness that the agencies are already activated and the budgets office is reviewing the recommendations for implementation. There was a request <laughs> made um, by the state commission that the office move with a sense of urgency um, to the task at hand. I don't have a sense of how that is being received and pro followed through on. Uh, do you have any sense of sort of uh, the proportionality of how these dollars are gonna be spent in the city, outside the city, uh, or, or any of it direct grants to the city for us to use? Um, I, I don't know. I think it is important to note, of course, that um, part of the assessment is looking at cities across the state, um, the varying needs and challenges faced. They're not dissimilar, of course, um, but the importance in making sure that there's a shared sort of infrastructure as well as uh, resources devoted across the state. I mean, I'm not picking on Buffalo, but I don't know, I don't know if Buffalo has historically such a, a low self-reporting rate as we do. Like, I mean, it, it would probably make sense to allocate the dollars where the challenges are. I don't know, do you, I mean, again, maybe it's, maybe Buffalo has a worse rate than us, I don't really know, but does it, do we have any sense of like where the need is in the state? I don't have a sense specifically on individual cities. Um, I would say through the work that we do with other cities, which is inclusive of Albany, Buffalo, amongst others, from an immigrant affairs lens, there are certainly refugees and other immigrant populations that are across the state um, that from sort of our point of view have similar challenges to ones that we're facing here. Okay. Uh, you know, even though it was number one, I didn't do it, but I really wanted to acknowledge uh, Julie Menon, that you've been everywhere. You know, we've done events together. I've seen you at other events, so I really, uh, you know, your commitment here and uh, more than just it's not talk, it's you're really out in the field. So I appreciate that. And, Thank you. Uh, we've worked closely together so far. So um, I do have, uh, so, uh, you know, some technical questions for city planning, but maybe even taking a step back. Um, I, I, I am concerned like how we like how do we know if we're doing a good job or doing a bad job in terms of count sure. uh, you know what, what what is the control so to speak in terms of just you know whether you know how this is going to work it's an excellent question and thank you for your comments earlier um, so one of the most exciting things uh, about the 2020 census is the fact that we are going to get real-time data from the Federal Census Bureau every single day during the self-response period. So what I mean by that is in mid-March, about a week after the first mailing goes out, we have spoken to the Federal Census Bureau and they will be providing us with real-time data by census tract on how every neighborhood is responding. We have a whole data team who's working now on how we're gonna be able to display that on our website in a really you know, easy to look at very quickly way. Um, we're gonna be using that in our advertising. So we are going to tell every neighborhood, every elected official, every single day, this is how your community is doing. So we're gonna know, for example, Benson Bensonhurst, you're at 2%, Williamsburg, 3%, Lower East Side, 5%. We're gonna know how each community is doing, where certain communities are underperforming and what we need to do so we can then critically bring resources and attention into those areas. I guess this is just the one question I've had over and over again that no one's been able to, like, one number is not useful unless we have a number to compare it to. So like, how, again, like if, if in the census tract, that comes back that there's 10 people there, mm -hmm. maybe I should be alarmed at, oh my God, there's, I think there's more people there, or I should say, wow, that's more than, like, how do we know, what, what are we comparing the, the data that you get back, how do you know if that's good data or bad data, or, or that there's a high rate or a low rate? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. I mean, what we're really looking to do, and our number one goal is to beat the 2010 self-response rates uh, from last time for every single neighborhood. So in terms of the data itself, I'm gonna defer to our colleagues at city planning to answer that. Um, so Peter, I don't know if you wanna weigh in on the council member's question. So we have, we'll be getting response rates for every neighborhood in the city and basically for every neighborhood in the country. So in terms of, you know, what do you compare it to? You compare it to other neighborhoods, you compare it to the city overall, or you compare it to the state or the, to the country. So you, th there's a benchmark there are plenty of benchmarks that could be used to actually see how well each neighborhood is doing. Okay, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Cabrera, and then I'll come back. Thank you so much uh, to the co-chair. Uh, so good to see everyone here today, and uh, 
Uh, Julie, it's good to see you. Thank you. First time I literally uh, met you when uh, the committee of South, what was it, South Manhattan Committee. We used to have a committee name like that. Uh-huh. And, uh, and That's right, the Lower were, Manhattan uh, Redevelopment Committee. There you yes. go, there <laughs> you go. And you were uh, the chair of, of the community board. And so it's, I appreciate all the work that you had done throughout this year as commissioners and now we, we, I feel very confident of the work that you're doing uh, right now. Thank you so uh, much. With our co-chairs uh, in the census. So uh, briefly, I, I don't have a lot of questions, and I know we have a lot of groups here waiting, but I wanted to ask you in terms of internet access, because this, since this is the first year that we are uh, using uh, uh, online capabilities, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know about would the city be using public spaces I'm gonna put four questions into one uh, to be parsimonious here. Uh, public spaces, uh, would the city be using their own computers, provide CBOs with tablets or computers? Uh, would the administration consider utilizing DCAS, civil service, exam centers? And which agencies will make I'm assuming they will, but uh, that they will make computers available. Sure, that's a great question. So I'm gonna take the first part of it and then turn it over to Amit Baga, who's the Deputy Director of the Census. Uh, so in terms of access online, we are gonna be creating hundreds of pop-up centers all around the city. Certainly all 219 public library branches will have computers and staff trained in the census. That's part of our grant to them and part of the deliverables that they will be doing. But we're also setting up pop-up centers in elected officials office, community board, civic organizations, houses of worship all over the city, and we're going to create an interactive map that lists all of the various centers so people will be able to know what center is closest to them. I also might add you're going to be able to fill your census out on your phone. So we do hope that the council, for example, during the self-response period at every meeting at the top will make a 60-second announcement to the audience, have you filled your census out, and give the site. And literally, people will be able to take the two minutes to answer the 10 questions and fill it out there. So that's just a very simple way that we can do it. But now I'm going to turn to Amit to about your question about whether or not the city is um, procuring computers and how we're working with community organizations okay. and public spaces. Thank you so much, Director Menon. Uh, my name is Amit Baga, Deputy Director of uh, the New York City Office for the Census. Um, thank you so much for your question, Council Member. Um, it's a very good one. Uh, it obviously stands to reason that many different city agencies that have public-facing spaces and that have computer terminals that are available uh, for the public to use might be able to make them accessible. We are in conversations with multiple city agencies that have uh, this type of, these types of computer uh, terminals available to see whether or not they can make them available to the public explicitly for the purpose of um, facilitating census participation. Um, in addition to that, I do want to also just point out that any of the uh, software that we will be providing community-based organizations with is going to comply with the highest standards. The city has incredibly high standards when it comes to data privacy and security. We are currently uh, deeply involved with uh, the law department as well as the mayor's chief privacy officer in conversations about what exactly those standards and protocols need to look like for community-based organizations. Um, and we're also in constant contact with the vendors from whom we're procuring the different pieces of software to make sure that they meet our standards, which are very high. You know, one of the questions I had was, you know, I, I don't know if this is ever going to happen to have online voting, and there are some legitimate concerns that we have right now because of hacking and internet security. But in this, the same kind of are we not dealing with the same kind of issues if we had online voting versus, uh, you know, the same security concerns when it comes to the census, people uh, being able to go online and w what kind of security? I just want people to feel safe that their information will be safe once they put it in. Uh, sure, so I'm happy yeah. to address that. So there are really two issues at play. One is 
when people fill the census out and transmit that information to the federal government, it is 100% legally protected by Title 13 of the U.S. Code. Title 13 of the U.S. Code is ironclad since its enactment. It has not been broken. And it actually subjects federal um, employees to a penalty of up to $250,000, five-year prison sentence if they are to share the census data. So they can't share it with the city, they can't share it with anyone else. So that is absolutely ironclad. In terms of the, the, the data security, I mean, as Amit referred to, I mean, we are taking every single precaution on this. I, I would add, and this is one of the messaging points that we really need to focus on, I think that a lot of people are not clear on what the census is and what it isn't. Many people confuse the census with the ACS, which is the long form survey that two to three percent of households receives. That is not what we're talking about here. That long form does have rather intrusive questions that ask you know, certain information. This census that we're talking about is 10 questions, your name, uh, your household, do you rent or own your home, your age, your gender, the number of people living in the home. It only takes a couple minutes to fill out, but yet it is one of the most important things someone can do to affect the future of the city. Beautiful. I, I'm going to come back later and ask more detailed questions regarding that, but I, I'll have one last question so we could get uh, uh, this hearing going. Has, have libraries ever experienced data breaches in the past? And if so, what lessons were learned and what steps are being taken to prevent future ones? Thank you so much for your question. It's, it's an important one. Um, I believe the library systems are here today, if I'm not mistaken, and I think they would be best suited to answer that. Anybody here from libraries? Okay, we'll be hearing from them, I guess, later on. Okay, great. All right, let me pass it to yeah, uh, Councilmember Rivera. Yeah. <laughs> we rhyme. Yeah. Thank you so much for your testimony. I do have a few questions. I want to talk a little bit about the financial agreement that we've reached and this hub, which I think is so important in utilizing the City University of New York. Because it's a public institution, and I believe that that's important to always, always support our public institutions, but also because it represents a, a diverse student body where many of them live in some of these harder to count neighborhoods and populations. So you, can you describe how CUNY's Census Corps students will assist the administration and the get out the count efforts of some of our partner community-based organizations? Uh, we're actually going to ask Kathleen Daniel, our field director, to answer that question. Before she does, can you please swear her in? She just should come up, no? Come up. Just come up. Great. And if you could put your hand up. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great, if you could introduce yourself. Before you Kathleen start. Daniel, Field Director, NYC Census 2020. So we are very excited about our collaboration with the CUNY, um, where we will have 200 students as part of SUNY, uh, CUNY Service Corps who will be paid to assist with the census campaign. And students, we're currently working on exactly what their descriptions are. They'll be able to choose one of three cohorts where they will be working with uh, community-based organizations. They'll be able to, a small cohort will work on leadership and leadership in the Knox program, the Neighborhood Organizing Census Committees. Um, they'll be able to help organize the CUNY campuses in the catchment area. As well, a very small cohort will work with our data group on exactly how data is going to come in and out and, and taking a look at how we're mapping each community. Thank you. I, I think the, the field portion of this is so important, as you know. And you mentioned the NOx, which is the Neighborhood Organizing Census Committees, and those being in neighborhoods across the city. What progress has the administration made in establishing NOx? So currently we have over, oh, a little over 500 volunteers signed up to work 
with their NOCs and in their NOCs. We've also conducted three teach-ins um, at our census headquarters where a little over 100 uh, volunteers attended and we have a number that have signed up to learn how to conduct their own teach-in and host a teach-in in their communities. So I've been uh, trying to get this message out about the census to anyone that will listen and I've been very intentional in talking to a lot of students and a lot of college students specifically. I, I, I was at BMCC, I was at uh, Columbia University. How can students get involved even in a volunteer capacity? Is that, some, is that a program that you'll have set up and ready to go? Is it ready? It is going to launch in the spring and we're working with CUNY right now um, on the beginnings of the advertisement and screening process for the service core that will happen at CUNY. But students can go to our website right now um, and visit the map and sign up to volunteer in their Knox. So will Knox have access to language interpreters and are they going to conduct outreach activities in other languages? Absolutely. What is um, one of the, the greatest things about the neighborhood team model that the Knox is based on, that the Knox are based on, is that these are nimble. Each community will be determining um, for themselves the, the best way for them to reach their neighbors and the businesses and houses of worship in their community. So Knox are not necessarily all in English. Um, and one of the key points of working with the field team, with field associates and lead organizers, will be for language access, to expand language access, um, to provide them some resources from toolkits, um, to teach-ins, to some technology that they can use to expand their reach within their neighborhood. So with the technology, what, what software will Knox be using to track its engagement, and how will data and info sharing work with council funded CBO partners, with the RFP awardees, the Federal Census Bureau, and the council. I'll take that question, council member. Hello, how are you? Hey. Uh, thank you for your questions, very important question. Uh, so we're currently in the process of negotiating contracts with a couple of different software vendors. Uh, we'll be able to share more information about which vendors they are and what platforms we're using shortly once those contracts uh, are negotiated. Uh, what we can share is that um, we are going to be building in, as I mentioned earlier, very strong privacy, data privacy and security protections into whatever the software platform is, and we, we're going to ensure that the uh, vendors for the platform are complying with the city's laws and rules. Well, we look forward to that update. I, I want to ask uh, just one more question, if that's okay, on this round. Can you tell me what steps, if any, the administration is taking to ensure that we accurately count our city's homeless population? Sure, I'm happy to start with that. So first of all, there are really two components to that. The Federal Census Bureau has a what they call a group quarter operation, which is any time, whether it be the homeless population or universities are also considered group quarters, they deal directly with the administrator and um, take that data into their group quarters. Then they're having three days in the spring where they're going to count the homeless population in the streets. Um, and so we obviously, when they told us that, want to work extremely closely with the Federal Census Bureau to make sure that this is done correctly and that everyone is counted. And so I don't know if you want um, to add. I, If I could just add to that, uh, we are actually very soon facilitating a meeting between the Federal Census Bureau and the Department of Social Services to ensure that whatever the Census Bureau's operations are, um, make sense to the Department of Social Services and that they are consistent with DSS's needs as well, and to ensure that DSS is uh, providing the Census Bureau with whatever information they need. So on the streets and in the shelter system. Correct. Correct. Thank you. And, and, and again, I just want to stress, I know that our community-based organizations are here and with, with the language piece, but also the volunteering piece, it's always great to have volunteers, right? But you need a, a strong infrastructure. So. I want to be helpful to you all in terms of how we're talking to people about the census and make sure that you have all the support that you need because I, I believe the field game is what's going to win this thing. So thank you. Thank you for all of your work. And thank you to the chairs for your gracious allotment of time. Council member, if you could help us recruit knock volunteers, that would be great. <laughs> Paid jobs.
These are volunteers. <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay, I'll help. Negotiation. I, I think we're all going to sign up for that. Um, the recruitment, and maybe even the help, actually. We can maybe all volunteer our time as well. Uh, we have been also joined by Councilmember Perkins, Rodriguez, and Powers. Uh, my questions will begin with uh, Commissioner Mustofi at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, in your testimony, I think a lot of the work that we have been doing uh, in just kind of addressing the fear that our community is feeling and the census is, is um, full of that right now. We also know that there's work to be done to bring people back from the citizenship question and the impact that that's had. Is there anything that the city is doing very kind of specific to counteract those fears and ensure that we get the complete count? Um, yeah, I will start and then of course um, the census team should jump in. So a big part of the role of our office has been sort of, as I highlighted, um, really thinking through how best you both work with, but also empower and get information out to communities with a recognition of sort of every, ever, all the sort of other issues um, and the environment that we're in. A part of that, of course, is ensuring that there are strong community-based organizations and leadership that are charged with and have the resources to um, conduct the uh, outreach uh, and work directly with communities um, that they serve. So that's certainly a part of the funding allocation that the, the council has uh, made discretionarily, but also, of course, um, the upcoming RFP process with CUNY, and um, we helped both inform the sort of structure of that RFP, but also um, how best to ensure that immigrant populations that might be either harder to reach or um, where there might be cultural or linguistic needs um, are included in, in selection. Um, additionally, uh, certainly the sort of messaging is important and I think we've learned over and over again and the census team is looking at this very closely um, as well as conducting surveys and other things to inform the thinking on this is what are the most effective uh, messages um, that will help uh, communities both understand and know why the census is important, but also address some of the needs or concerns that they might have about privacy. And of course, that will inform both how we talk about uh, the census itself, but also the larger communications and marketing work. Sure, so I'm happy to also address that. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have is to combat this misinformation and disinformation that has been spread and really in every forum that we do, this question indeed comes up and that is why we feel very strongly that the $19 million grant program and partnering so closely with the community-based organizations who are the, literally the trusted voice oftentimes in the neighborhood it will help us to make sure that every New Yorker knows the citizenship question is indeed off. We also of course in advertising and marketing um, have the flexibility to be messaging that out if we feel that that's something that needs to be further addressed as well. Thank you for that. It, may I add to that just briefly? Um, just to add very briefly to what Director Menon and Commissioner Mustafi have said, we also know that constructing the right type of messaging that's going to really resonate with different communities across the city is incredibly important. And that's one of the reasons that within the context of our citywide partner group, we have a working group that's specifically dated, uh, excuse me, dedicated towards communications, right? And the members of this working group represent various communities across the city. And we know that slightly different messages are going to resonate slightly differently in different places, right? And so we need to be prepared for that. And so part of the work that we're doing with our partners such as United Way and New York Immigration Coalition and Make the Road and AFI and others, many others, um, is to really think through exactly how to tailor that messaging for each community. Well, let's stay on messaging for a bit and talk a little bit about the media and advertising campaign. I think that's kind of been a reference to in terms of the kind of larger conversation that's gonna be happening mm -hmm. across the city. Uh, when will you announce your media and advertising campaign plan? Shortly, what we're doing right now is really looking at pricing. We are looking at making sure that we have the farthest reach possible. Looking at TV, radio, digital, 
print, but particularly focusing on community and ethnic, on multilingual advertising that's really going to reach every single New Yorker. So we expect to make that announcement soon. Uh, the advertising will not um, hit until 2020 because, again, we're trying to most judiciously utilize our resources. So we felt that advertising in this year would not be a judicious uh, use of our resources. Do you have a sense of what the ethnic media networks will be? Uh, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that different ethnic groups and uh, linguistic groups uh, consume media in different ways. Uh, we know that the way Bangladeshis consume media in Ozone Park is different than the way West African groups do in the Southwest Bronx, let's say. So right now what we're doing, and this is part of what Director Menon mentioned, is working very closely with our citywide partners as well as with Moya to really do a needs assessment of what are all of the different types of media that exist, including types of media that some of us in government perhaps might not initially think about. Once we have conducted that full needs assessment, we will then be able to have a clearer picture and understanding of how we're going to invest those dollars and where. So this could include different types of social media platforms, such as WhatsApp, possibly. I'm not committing to it necessarily, but it's something that has been raised. Um, we've also heard, for example, that certain West African groups really consume news and information through audio messages. So that's something that we need to be thinking about, for example, when we're thinking about a particular ethnic group. So once we have a more complete picture of that, we'll be able to share that with and you. And the only other point that I would add is that in 2010, the messaging was largely done by the federal government and was incredibly uniform, the messaging being fill out the census, it's your civic duty and the Constitution, it's the law, and it wasn't micro-targeted. We're completely flipping that model. We want to micro-target our messaging to various communities so that people really understand what's at stake. So when we're talking to parents and we explain to them Title I funds are at risk here, that is a, a motivating and that's the kind of messaging that we need to do that really we feel was lacking before. Sorry, I'll, can I add a little briefly to that too? Um, I'm not sure if this is part of what you were getting at with your question, but um, we noted in my testimony as far back as April of 2018, partnered also with CUNY School of Journalism and their, specifically their community and ethnic media um, uh, division, and they are tremendous partners, and a part of that was obviously intentional, is starting early and often with community and ethnic media, because part of the game here is the census is often not intimately understood or known, and so um, we know that from that work, CUNY is actually establishing fellowships for community and ethnic media outlet to educate on the census and ensure that um, the outlets both deeply understand it, but can talk about it in different and nuanced ways to keep it alive and center to uh, the work that they're doing, which is going to be very critical uh, going into next year and until uh, the count is completed. I think part of what, what we'd like to know and how we can be helpful is understanding when those gaps become known, um, how to fill them. And I think that's what we're, because we, you know, we, we at the council are all often asking the same questions of our work and how we do our work. Uh, and this isn't the only project that has kind of required us to, to, to dig deeper about how, how we know what, what we know. Um, and so really, I think there's a few other questions that I'll skip, but some of the things that we do know is that um, past successful city media campaigns um, might be places that we start. Are there any that emulate that almost perfection that you know that's in your study? Yes. So when I was Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, we launched the paid sick leave law, and we opted to have our advertising in 25 languages. So we went well above and beyond the language access requirements, and we felt um, and Amit Baga was there as well. Uh, we felt that that uh, really was very efficacious. I think it really reached communities all across the city, and we had a tremendous response uh, to that in terms of paid sick leave. So we are absolutely looking at that as a paradigm, um, as one of many of successful media and advertising campaigns that the city has launched. Something that's new is Link NYC. How is that? Is that embedded into the work that you're thinking about doing for rollout? Absolutely. We're looking at activating every single possible place that you can uh, have for media. I mean, our goal, honestly, is in 2020 that everywhere you go in the city, you see some kind of messaging around the census so that on March 12th, when people start to receive the mailers, this is not a surprise that you're receiving this mailer.
I like that. Um, it's part of the expectation. And on that note, do you have an idea about who your media spokespeople will be? You know, who will be on the ads? Who will be that face of the of the message? So we are working on that right now. We will make an announcement soon about that. We're not ready to make an announcement yet. It's still uh, we're still working on that. I'll add to just to say in terms of campaigns that have worked and why. Um, I think. We certainly knew in our work with IDNYC and our campaign that part of what worked and resonated with people was seeing a diversity of both faces but also messages. Not everybody wanted to participate for the same exact reason or was interested in the program for the same exact reason. So there wasn't a single, single ad as duplicate there were myriad ads with diverse messages targeting different populations and different needs, and people got to see themselves reflected in different ways. And so that's certainly, uh, we announced this morning, a repeat for what we're doing for renewal um, and kind of building on those lessons and some of certainly what um, the team is looking at as well. Yeah, I think those are those are good, not only good points, but uh, uh, back to how we emulate the good stuff, that was, that was pretty strong. Um, maybe my last, my last point, question, um, a request of the panel really is committing that we feature everyday New Yorkers from all different backgrounds um, and communities. And I'm gonna go a little bit further. Part of what we had done in some other uh, programs uh, like Adult Literacy, We Speak New York is uh, a really kind of fantastic uh, investment that the city has made. And part of our conversations, and I don't know if it made it was pu made public, but I'll make it public now. We really requested that there was uh, a, a kind of opportunity that we take to remove any elected officials or representatives of elected officials on the messaging, uh, that they should really be people on the, from our neighborhoods that can be reflected as, sp as spokespeople. And so I'm asking that as a part of the commitment, will you commit that we feature everyday people and not, not uh, elected officials or representatives of elected officials and, mm -hmm. and part of the administration um, as you continue to craft this public campaign. Okay, great, thank you. Now we appreciate that comment and, and we agree because one of the things I think that is has most struck me in this work around the census is that when you explain to people how it affects our everyday life, it really, really resonates. And one of the challenges has been that the messaging in 2010 wasn't about the lack of funding. And so people really didn't know all this funding was at stake. And so that's the messaging that we really want to get across. Well, and again, I just, the commitment is that no elected officials or representatives of elected officials will be on any of the sponsored campaigns. That's what I'm asking. Okay. And that's the commitment that we're asking of you today. Oh, so no elected officials and no... No, that it becomes a back to... Okay, we don't, well, we don't have anything out there yet, so that's... No, that's what I'm yeah. saying. We're in a good place right now where right. We're, we're, we're developing. That's something that's being developed, and we're asking that be a commitment that we can kind of hear from okay. you guys. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Can I just add one thing, though, to sure. say, which is... I think echoing what I said before, which is part of what we saw as effective was that there was a diversity of faces and voices, right? It was seen as sort of a citywide effort. Um, so there were, they weren't, they weren't on everything, right? But there was a PSA that included Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and the mayor, right? So that was an element of what broader intentionality and in getting, showing that there was city sort of support and buy-in um, and leadership, but that this was about people and the community and representation. So I know this is a bigger conversation, but I do want to sort of footnote or caveat that I do think it's actually important for there to be a show of leadership, not on necessarily leading all the ads, but an element of what is looked at as important. I guess all I'm saying is that the strongest part was not elected officials, yes. it was the people. <laughs> and that's what the emphasis is yeah. coming. No, and we agree that obviously having diverse New Yorkers from every single neighborhood is a critical component, and that's what we want to be able to emphasize. It certainly with the paid sick leave law, how we conducted our advertising and marketing, and absolutely. But I think to the commissioner's point, it's also going to be important to have you know many, many voices. We really want to bring all stakeholders to the table. As and all I'm, just, all I'm saying is that this is the, fo the focus is on the paid stuff that goes out. Obviously, we're gonna be on our Twitter and doing all that good work. Um, but I think, we, I think we're, mm -hmm. we're in agreement mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some members that have questions. Uh, we are gonna put you on a clock. Uh, 
Chin, Perkins, and Powers. Uh, Councilmember Chin, is, are you here? Yes. Okay, we're, we have three minutes, and you can go. Thank you, Chair. I am really excited. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation, especially about the, uh, um, you know, the day-to-day -day data mm -hmm. to see how we're doing. And I heard that from your testimony, Director Menon, that you said that New York City, you divided into 245 neighborhoods. So that is much smaller than a city council district. So when it, each one of our district, we're probably gonna have a couple of neighborhoods, right? Right. right. Um, so was there any kind of thinking in terms of how you divide it up? Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So we really worked very closely with city planning to make sure that each of the 245 neighborhoods had uh, criteria that made sense. Uh, so I, if you want to talk about a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Director Menon. Uh, hi, Council Member Chen. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, yes, so what we did was that uh, looking at a list of uh, neighborhoods that DCP has developed over time and also just utilizing some of our knowledge as native New Yorkers, as many of us in the office are, uh, we organized the city into 245 different neighborhoods. And we did that because, as Director Menon has said uh, on other occasions, we really needed to come up with an apparatus where uh, individuals could understand how the place they live performed in 2010, right? A lot of average New Yorkers might not know their community board or their council district, but everyone knows which neighborhood they live in. Uh, so we organized these neighborhoods uh, based on this existing list and around census tract boundaries. Uh, it just so happens that most census tract boundaries in New York City actually, when you put them in a group, uh, can sort of easily constitute a neighborhood. Uh, and in doing so, uh, what we've now done on our website is that you can go directly onto our website and you'll see a map of the 2010 initial self-response rates by neighborhood. And you can click on the map and get that information. And then you can click it on and volunteer directly for that local neighborhood organizing committee. And the idea behind dividing the city into 245 neighborhoods really emanated from sort of uh, my community board days and other um, members of our team who really, we felt very strongly that everything is very hyper-local well, and people want to volunteer. Well, there's going to be some friendly yes. competition here. <laughs> yes, exactly. Between all the community boards and all the city council districts. Yes. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about is uh, um, no, city planning, I'm glad that you're adding addresses. One of my concerns is really the non-traditional household. Mm. You know, the basement apartment, the doubling up, the tripling up, that is still the population that we have to get people, like, it's okay if you live in a basement apartment, sign up, you know, get yourself counted. And I guess the city will figure out how to put them all together. And we want to make sure that, uh, because, you know, that's the way it is, lack of affordable housing. And I agree with you that the messages of how funding is so critical that if we want, you know, better schools, better housing, we got to sign up. And there should be some kind of general slogan that really bring all of us together, that we're all, you know, New York City, we have to get ourselves counted. And I think that with all the agency that you work with, like Senior Center, everyone who walked into the Senior Center that day for lunch signed up. Um, so I think that is something that I'm really looking forward to next year. And I think we'll challenge ourselves with some friendly competition. Right? That, <laughs> Thank you. I like that, Councilmember Chen. Uh, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you. I, I, um, I'm concerned about uh, some communities, <laughs> such as what I even represent, um, don't take the census at the level of interest and importance um, and might even have fears about what that census is really about. So what are we doing to dispel those kinds of fears and encourage folks to understand that the census is about them and the betterment of their family lives and the betterment of their community? How are we getting out to communities uh, that are suspicious of uh, certain types of uh, public uh, activity that supposedly is to their benefit but doesn't quite resonate uh, in terms of the language or in terms of the lifestyle or in terms of what they tend to believe uh, is appropriate. 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to answer that question, Council. It was an excellent question. And so one of the challenges is just what you have identified is explain to people why they should take the two minutes to fill this out. But the good news is, and we have done, I mean, dozens and dozens, hundreds of events since this office started in January all around the city, but particularly in communities that had lower self-response rates, is when you explain to people the funding that's at stake for public education, for public housing, for Medicaid, for Head Start, for senior centers, the number of people who have said to us, I didn't realize that. I thought the census was just some, you know, an intrusive government form. Why are they asking this information? So when we are able to explain it, the response has been incredible. And that's why we're so focused on our messaging. Our advertising and media has to be hyper-local. It has to speak to communities on issues that resonate with them. In that regard, you know, uh, for instance, um, there are some communities, particularly one that I represent, where the faith-based community is very, very influential. Um, they don't, I'm not necessarily advocating <laughs> any particular faith, but I know in the neighborhood that I represent, the churches are crowded on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to me to be an opportunity, or, and knowing other uh, such instances that will um, encourage people to participate, and in fact, quite the opposite, um, it will probably do more than encourage them, it'll help them understand that it's really about them. Because Absolutely, we've hired a faith-based coordinator in our office who is um, really working very hard on faith-based outreach. What's the name of that person? Nancy Pascal. And how do we reach Nancy Pascal? Do you want to give her? Uh, if sure, that's not Council, Council Member, we will be providing her contact information to you right after the hearing. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Perkins and uh, Council Member Powers, followed by uh, Chair Cohen. Thank you. And sorry to miss part of your testimony, but it's good to get here at the end. I just want to start by welcoming a friend of mine who is a guru on all things. I want to talk about uh, data and census. My former professor, John Malenkoff from the Graduate Center, who's here today. And I know we'll have a lot to contribute to this process. Um, I, when we talk about uh, both the fears, you talked a little bit about uh, motivation for folks wanting to participate in it. I think that is a concern I have with folks in my district is, there are those who are civically active and then those who need to be persuaded about why this actually matters. And I think the skepticism of process and government and outcomes and voting and things like that contribute to people not wanting to participate. Is there any information either from prior census or things that you've been seeing so far about what are the primary motivators for somebody to actually fill it out? Is it, I assume ease of doing it is a big part of it, but it, whether, it, whether it's around the funding or other implications is there? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, certainly it will be much easier to fill the census out now that it is online. The fact that it, whether it's at a community board meeting, a council meeting, when someone makes an announcement and people can take their phone out and fill it out in two minutes on the spot is going to, in our opinion, make a difference. Um, but certainly we do need to continue to hammer home the messaging about what's at stake both for the funding and the political representation piece. And I think that's what those of us now who are doing this work are most struck by, the number of people who are very civically engaged, but really who didn't have that information, largely because it hadn't been provided about the number of programs that are at stake here and that affect their daily life. And, and not to undermine some of the work you're doing, but there, but there is a, I mean, there is gonna be Either, I mean, there, there is potentially, even if we count every single person in New York City or New York State, the potential that we lose funding based on population shifts in the country. Isn't that correct, too? Correct. I mean, I'm going to defer to DCP on overall population shifts in the country to answer that. <clears throat> New York State uh, isn't growing as fast as Texas as Florida. So just based on you know, population shifts, uh, given the fact that they're growing at a much faster pace, they're likely to gain seats uh, at the expense of states that aren't growing fast enough. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember, if, yeah. I, if I could just add specifically to address your question about motivations, 
Uh, I think two things uh, that we've seen in our outreach and through some of the message testing we've done. Number one, uh, New Yorkers in general, and I think all of you who've had to run campaigns in New York certainly know this, don't necessarily love the idea of people knocking on their door, right? And I think the uh, fact that the census is online for the first time next year presents us with a real opportunity. If you complete the census online, the likelihood that you get an enumerator coming to your door significantly decreases. So that is one motivator. The other motivator that I think is actually very important for all of us to keep in mind, and Director, mentioned, Director Menon mentioned this earlier, uh, is the fact that your information is protected by Title 13. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll end, obviously end my questions there. I, I, one other thing I've noticed is that I think that many of the council members will be doing participatory budgeting at the same time where you're starting somewhere around March. So mm -hmm. I think there's a potential for some level of coordination between people doing one, one civic duty of voting. That's a likely person that should be filling out the census, obviously, as, as well. So, you know, I think there's a potential for coordination with some members around their individual district uh, voting. Great, thank you, it's a great idea. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be brief because I realize that we have a lot of uh, people who'd like to testify, but you know, one of the things that uh, as a council member that I am most proud of uh, is the tremendous creation of affordable housing, particularly in Bronx County where, where I come from. Uh, so I guess really for city planning, uh, these new units of housing, how, how do we account for them just and how do I have confidence uh, that all of this uh, new housing, you know, I go into neighborhoods, you know, Melrose, I don't know where I am anymore because of, uh, of all these uh, the new developments, but really how do, how do we have confidence in the Bronx that those new, uh, new members of the community are going to be counted? So historically, the issue was uh, subdivided housing. How do you get units that are subdivided? How do you get basement apartments? Uh, but we were actually very successful uh, in actually getting them using corner data, using phone data. Most of the new housing coming online is actually new construction. And you have to file a permit to actually be able to construct stuff. And then we actually get a final certificate of occupancy. So these are all official data. Uh, and uh, as I said, we're going to be uh, submitting over 100,000 new units, a lot of them in the Bronx. In fact, in terms of population growth, Bronx has seen the fastest population growth uh, in the city, thanks to all this new construction. Yeah, well, that's great. It's important that I think that the resources that come with the census uh, come to the Bronx. So uh, I appreciate that, and uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Cohen. And one of the questions that uh, is coming from us from some of the na our neighbors, uh, uh, they're really interested in applying for jobs. Uh, is there something that you've been able to take in a in a kind of affirmative, an affirmative way to encourage New Yorkers to apply for census jobs? And what, what kind of things has the mayor's office done? Absolutely. So, so we've been a part of job fairs all over the city with the Federal Census Bureau. At every single event that we have, we have always um, worked to encourage people to apply for the jobs. We're in constant contact with the Federal Census Bureau, um, g sending candidates over to them, both for partnership jobs, for enumerator jobs, and that's been something that we've been very focused on. If I could just add to that, yes. um, now that the Census Bureau has been able to obtain its waiver to hire non-citizens, uh, this is particularly important in terms of our messaging when we're out in the field. Uh, we're also working closely with city agencies that we know have access to large pools of New Yorkers who need employment and can benefit from short-term employment, um, and that's part and parcel of our interagency engagement plan. CBOs are going to be a big part of this, and the hub really kind of represents the, the access they're going to have to resources. What about the work um, around language support, specifically partnering with CBOs uh, to, t to ensure that materials are translated, but not just translated, but in a manner that's understandable and culturally competent? I think we all kind of hit the general goals of translation, but how are you measuring your competency? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I, I, I can take it. Um, so as Director Menon mentioned, um, both she and I have been part of city agencies where this was a really high priority for us and also making sure that the materials that were translated made sense in context, right? Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're partnering with a translation firm that we know tends to have uh, much more culturally competent translations, not just technically correct. Who? who? Uh, 
we should probably share it with you later. Later. Okay. Um, but happy there are, to there's, a, there's an entity. Yes, there's there a, is an okay. entity. Um, in addition to that, though, and this is where our partnership with the Citywide Partners is once again very important, we're going to be working through our communications working group as part of our Citywide Partner Working Group to socialize and review all of the translations that we receive back so that we can actually ensure that the translations make sense. So that's the mechanism. That's, that's the mechanism. Okay. And, and we also know that when we fund particular community small community-based organizations that represent specific communities that perhaps are not as large, that's part of what we're going to ask them to do for us. Okay, thank you. There's a few other questions, but we're going to put them in a, in a document, send them over, and continue the conversation. Are there any other members who have questions? Okay. Um, thank you to the members, and thank you to all for your time and effort, and let's keep marching forward into our next oversight hearing on this, and uh, upward and onwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a panel. Thank you so much. Uh, Steven Romaluski from CUNY Graduate Center. And I'm assuming you're the professor. Uh, and John Malenkoff from the Center for awesome. Human Urban Research, also from CUNY Graduate Center. You can begin. No sworn in. We just we know you're going to tell us the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk about some of our, some of our work. Yes, and I just, I just want to remind you, you're going to be on the clock. Um, so we have your testimony as well. So just hit us with the top points and really things that would be great to hear in anticipation of of not just your work, but maybe in addressing what was said by the administration, and we're gonna reset your clock, three minutes, go. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephen Romaleski, and I work at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I'll be talking uh, briefly about uh, some of the work that we're doing in terms of mapping and providing data analysis to help census stakeholders uh, ensure a fair and accurate count in the 2020 census. We, we, our team at the Graduate Center was asked by a coalition of civil rights organizations and funders to map hard to count communities throughout the country back in 2010 and then now leading up to the 2020 census. And you can see a screenshot of the map uh, that's online. Um, we launched this application in October of 2017, so well in advance of some of the activities that we talked about earlier. And the idea is that it tries to provide information about these hard-to-count communities that has, that's been talked about. So what does that mean? Um, in the context of the decennial census, the most important thing, as was mentioned earlier, is for people to self-respond to the census. In 2020, that means they'll be able to uh, do that online, by phone, or by mail. And if you don't, that means the census has to hire staff to knock on your door and count you in person. That's challenging, that's expensive, and that presents the greatest risk that people will be missed. And so what we've done is look back to the 2010 census and highlighted areas on the map uh, that have large shares of households that did not self-respond, and therefore, there had to be a lot of door-to-door -door, uh, enumeration, which again presents a risk that people got missed, and there was an undercount. Um, in New York City, 58% of the population lives in these so-called hard-to-count census tracts. In Brooklyn, it's even higher, 80% of the population. In Queens, 67% of the population lives in the, these areas. So it's a, a visualization of the challenge that is before the, the city. But we also provide a wealth of other information through the map that can be of help to council members, stakeholders, and others. Uh, uh, internet access, you can see areas that have poor internet access. You can see where the public library branches are, are located. Um, and also populations at risk of being undercounted 
all of that information is available that can be used to inform uh, the outreach efforts and the get out the count campaigns uh, that are being talked about. It's really great that the council and the city has uh, decided to invest in trusted partners. They can use this information to great effect uh, to get that information out. And I should point out that we'll be enhancing this information going forward. So uh, during the 2020 enumeration, we'll show the information about the real-time self-response rates. You'll be able to compare that back to 2010 to see how well your area is doing compared to then and compared to other areas now. That, that information, by the way, will be available nationwide, not just here in New York. This map is nationwide, so you can look to see how this area compares to other parts of the country, other parts of the state. And so we hope that this is a tool that organizations and council members and other elected officials and, and groups can use uh, to help ensure a fair and accurate count in 2020. Thank you. Two pieces of clarification. One is, th is the website also translated in other languages? It is not. Okay. Um, um, I don't know what that would entail, but let's talk about that later. Sure. And then the second question is, um, in terms of the real time, I, I just want everyone to be clear that the only real time information we're going to get at the end of the day is stuff that comes in online, not mail. No, back. the and census so can, can you talk a little bit about the lag time, and then and then we'll go to uh, Professor John. Malcolm. So starting March 20, well, I should back up. In early March, the Census Bureau will start sending out mailings to every household in the city and most households across the country. On March 20th, uh, 2020, the Census Bureau will start publishing da daily uh, data by census tract and also for other geographies um, about the share of households that have self-responded, whether that's online, by phone, or if they've sent in a paper questionnaire. So it'll include all of that information. They'll separately provide a, a data point about how many households have responded online so you can gauge what component is online and what's not. Um, the Association for Better New York sponsored a survey in earlier this year, and uh, 45 or so percent of the respondents in New York City said they were not planning to fill out the questionnaire online. So the, not only is it a challenge in terms of areas that don't have internet access or don't have good internet access, but it's also a challenge in terms of making sure people understand the different ways that they'll be able to respond they don't have to do it online, and if they don't do it online, how else they're going to do that? Thank you. My name is John Mollenkoff. I'm a professor at the CUNY Graduate Center and also work with Steve in the Center for Urban Research at the Graduate Center. And I've spent a lot of time over the years looking at census data for New York City and also studying patterns of civic engagement, uh, both in terms of voting and also I've been a consultant for New York City Service and did a large-scale survey of civic engagement uh, in New York City over the last couple of years. And uh, the main reason that I'm here today is, first of all, to congratulate both the administration and the council for doing such a fantastic job in promoting community engagement in doing the census. New York City, with its uh, commitment to the Complete Count Fund, has far and away more resources devoted to this than uh, Los Angeles or Chicago. I'm working with colleagues in LA and Chicago in an effort to understand which types of activities have the greatest effect, to use this as a learning event as well as a, a large-scale civic engagement event. And my main takeaway point here uh, is that it's important to build into the reporting system for the grantees uh, some way of capturing the efforts that are made with some both temporal and geographical detail of what is happening when and where so that we can match the, the input effort, if you will, with the out, output or the outcome in terms of this track level uh, progress towards a, a full count that we're hoping for so that not only uh, will we have spent a, a large amount of money in a, in a really good effort, but we will have learned from that what aspects of those effort, efforts work best and what aspects work least, and, and that'll leave us with a very important uh, set of lessons about civic engagement in general uh, in the city for after the census takes place. Well, I meant to ask you, I'm gonna make it real quick. Have you, have there ever been done a campaign uh, where it addresses, I think the core issue here is trust. Uh, and the greatest commodity I think society could ever have is trust. And 
basically most either trust or people just don't know the value of it. But has there ever been a campaign where you're, you are able to engage cel TV celebrities, uh, artists, uh, and the such where people tend to look up to and admire and have them sh you know, demonstrate, hey, I'm doing it, you could do it as well. Has there ever been a campaign like that? And what do you see you know, the value I, I, of that? I think there's a vast amount of, of knowledge that's been accumulated about the effectiveness of marketing techniques generally on consumer behavior and, and certainly uh, important cultural figures endorsing something is, is one of the ways that messages get through. But I would compare this more to something like uh, a political campaign in which we're seeking to get individual engagement. And there have been a lot of studies of what affects voter turnout in terms of diff different kinds of techniques. And there, one of the most effective techniques is to have people trusted partners, people from the neighborhood who speak to you in some one-on-one -on -one capacity, whether it's knocking on doors or, or at meetings. I've also done an experiment with the New York Immigration Coalition uh, about voter turnout of immigrant origin voters focusing both on Chinese surname and Latino surname voters in the 2017 uh, primary and general elections in New York City. And there we sent we sent letters to these voters talking about their own voting record, which is a matter of uh, public information, as well as what's going on in the neighborhood. And those, those letters raised the uh, turnout for those in the, in the treatment group uh, by three to five percentage points on, on a base of about 30 percentage points. So this is a, you know, a targeted communication to individuals from an organization, the New York Immigration Coalition, that was a trusted organization for many of these groups. And so I, I think we have hard evidence that a well-targeted effort can have a real impact. And from hearing what uh, Director Menon was talking about in terms of the micro-targeting that was going on, um, you know, I would have a high degree of confidence that the city is, is thinking as carefully as possible about this. If I could add to that, sure. just one aspect of how we visualize the information about what's hard to count and what's not. If you look on the map in Washington Heights and Inwood, for example, you'll see that most of those tracts, a large share of households, self-responded. They mailed back their forms in 2010 to ensure that the undercount would be minimized in those areas. Those are areas that otherwise would be considered hard to count because of the population characteristics, but there was a a dedicated, concerted, grassroots organizing effort in those communities to make sure that people understood the value of, of responding to the census, and it really worked. So you look at those areas compared to some of these other neighborhoods where a large share of households just didn't send the form back, and uh, I think also that's evidence that that type of organizing effort really works, really yeah. pays off. The, thing, uh, the only point I wanted to make is, uh, and, and I to the conclusion of the idea that culture trumps everything. It, it trumps all the systems, all the strategies. And so if you have a culture which says, hey, this, this, is, this is really good for our community, uh, it adds value to our community, uh, it empowers our community. For young people, this is a cool thing to do. And you know, all of, all of the above. Uh, and, we see that even in politics, right? That the culture of and, and ideas that are floating around. So uh, I, I hope in this campaign there will be some of that to just foster uh, that level of trust. Let me give it back to uh, my co-chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Uh, Chair Cohen, for questions? Chair Cohen, for questions? Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, I think in part maybe this is a legal question and I think that we'll have people who could testify uh, maybe. But I guess it's my understanding that sort of that the law requires, like in, in your lab with the computers, you could probably come up with a more accurate analysis and, and tell us more accurately a population count than the, the methodology we're using. Well, the census itself is relying 
steadily more on administrative data to substantiate what it's finding out from its own survey. So administrative data could be things like voter registration uh, information. It, it, it could be participation in federal programs. Um, so, so the, you know, the government has a fa vast amount of data of, of who's connecting with what that it can specify at the address level. I guess, but sampling is not allowed, we're not permitted, right? No, well, I think the idea of the census is to get everyone and not, not just a sample. But not, not use a sample to extract, I mean, but, well, there, uh, but we're, we have a room full of people testifying about the challenges yes. of trying to get, um, I think, I think if you were trying for, if you were publishing a scientific paper, you would probably try to do both. You'd try to supplement your field findings with sampling to try to, but we don't, I don't think we do that. You know, it, it's interesting that if you look at the, the 2010 male response rates and the other hard to count indicators, um, it, it correlates with other data sets that we, we've looked at that are, are very fine grained in their geographic detail. In particular, there's a very strong correlation between voter turnout levels and response to the census. So we can, we can look at contemporary. Yeah, but the unfortu unfortunately in my business, voter turnout is not that great either, so. It's not that great, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that suggests that th this is gonna be a really major challenge for us to, in, to get a full count. And so, you know, it behooves us to you know, lean on the most effective techniques possible to get as close to a full count as we can. Because, um, I mean, there's a potential that it could be disastrous because it's a completely new method to, uh, they're counting, the census is counting on 60% of the people nationwide going online and volunteering their information and filling it out online. So it, it's a completely novel experiment. It's never been, Nothing like this has ever been tried before. So, uh, and again, to go back to my first point, the fact that the council and the administration have joined together to put this level of resources into promoting a full count is you're setting a, a nationwide standard. This is much more money than Los Angeles or Chicago has, has put into similar efforts. So I think the whole country will be watching New York City to see you know, what the effect of this uh, investment that you've made is, is going to be. The Census Bureau will supplement the actual count if you don't self-respond and if you don't answer the door for a census enumerator with statistical methods and administrative records. That's why it's so important for households to self-respond so they tell the census exactly how many people live there and if they don't, that they open the door to a census enumerator so they can give that exact information to the enumerator because if they don't, and there are a number of tracts in Brooklyn and Queens in particular where there's 20% or more of the population that was counted statistically because the Census Bureau was not able to reach them through the mail and was not able to reach them through the door-to-door -door efforts. So you don't want that. No, I understand. <laughs> that you really need that 100% count done through the way the Census Bureau is doing. You don't, if you have to, okay, try to rely on those other things, but that's where the undercount comes in. That's where the miscount comes in. You want to try to avoid that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Cohen, for those questions, and thank you both for, for coming today. And we'll, we'll keep talking to you about civic engagement part, uh, and thinking about it through the lens of the community. Thanks for inviting us to be here. Thank you. We'll have now Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. It's hard to follow the wonderful CUNY folks. They are fabulous. Um, my name is Gail Brewer, I am the Manhattan Borough President, and I wanna thank all of the chairs and all the committees for the opportunity to testify today. We all know that this count is beyond essential. Pulling off a decennial census in the US requires a Herculean civic effort, and this is even more so, as you know. We're not living under normal circumstances. 
um, so I just want to talk about what we've been doing because you know the rest of it. So we have 1.7 million residents in the borough of Manhattan. 28% are foreign born. Believe it or not, we have numerous hard to count census tracts. Obviously in low income and immigrant communities, obviously in public housing developments, but elsewhere. In 2010, in Manhattan, the hardest count areas, maybe no surprise, were Central Harlem and East Harlem. Just as hard was Midtown. Midtown was even harder. And Chinatown was also very difficult. And we all know that, and maybe Steve, the great Steve Romanowski, whom I love, he might have pointed out that the financial district since 9-11 2001 has gone from 20,000 to 70,000. So that's a huge number. And also Hudson Yards has a, many new residents. So those all have to be counted. And we all know that, you know, what the challenges are, losing house seats, et cetera, and all the funding that is at uh, a challenge for all of us without getting into all of that. And we have to lock in until 2030 perhaps the most important time of our lives given what we're dealing with in Washington. So given all of this above, uh, last year, we looked at the Commerce Department's request for comments on the citizenship question, and the way we answered it, I thought was quite innovative. We rented a bus, and we went to Providence, Rhode Island, which is where the pilot was for the Census Bureau. It was the only nationally representative dry run, end-to-end -end rehearsal for the 2020 Census. And we worked with the mayor there and his wonderful staff. And we took with us about 50 or 60 people from the city council, uh, CUNY, Department of City Planning, city and state government, community boards, nonprofit organizations, Latino Justice as an example, the Central Labor Council, Asian American Foundation, many, many immigrant rights groups and AVNI and others. And they all went on this bus. The mayor provided a delicious lunch but more importantly was we got to see from the Portuguese community's perspective what worked. And one example was this amazing woman who'd been dean at a community college, not dissimilar from CUNY's community colleges, and who was head of the Portuguese American academics dean at the college. And she was also head of the organization that works with the Portuguese community in Providence. That was the only way she got folks counted is because she was trusted and respected. Um, and that was a clear, nothing new for us to learn, but it was such a clear message. So I will be very quick because I know I'm supposed to be, uh, but I wanted to say what we have done here in Manhattan. Certainly we have a Manhattan Counts initiative. We funded 12 trusted organizations with the expense money that we have. One of them is working with the Interfaith Center of New York, and they're taking with several faith groups like the Catholic Charities, UJ Federation, and many others, and they're doing what I call sermon notes. So they're taking all the religious organizations in Manhattan and working with the sermon notes to talk about census, number one. Number two, we're working with something called Uptown Grand Central, which is like a chamber of commerce, but a little bit more grounded and very on the grassroots on the east 123th Street, working with local businesses, pop-up tents to do the kind of work to count, to get people ready. Third, no surprise, we have organizations funded with the Muslim, Chinese, Korean, and Latinx community, and more importantly, with all of the art groups in the borough of Manhattan. Edgy art could make a big difference for people being involved in the census, and that's what we're gonna produce. All the individuals who produce food and deliver it to the homebound are gonna be trained because when you're homebound, the only person you trust is the person who brings your food and that person will pr bring a laptop or an iPad and help you fill it out. That's another example. Um, we've also been going to the places where there is opportunity for getting employment. We've been doing this with the wonderful U.S. Census Group. Despite what's going on in Washington, the folks are terrific from the U.S. Census. We're working with Google's training center. We've had offices, uh, employment times in our office and on November 13th in our storefront at 125th Street and with seven or eight organizations, it's the Harlem Census Recruitment Day and we will be doing it all across the Harlem community. We have a complete count committee. The next meeting is November 18th here at the Municipal Building and we'll be talking about some of these issues. Deputy Borough President Aldrin Bonilla did the count for the Borough of Manhattan 20 years ago, and he came in number one. So 
with all due respect to your other boroughs, watch out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Borough President Brewer. Uh, I, I don't know if the members have questions, but I just have a challenge. Uh, I know Brooklyn, Brooklyn has yeah, come in. Yeah. Well, you, you know what I'm going to say. You know, Brooklyn has some challenges, and it's on the map right now. Uh, the reason we're not showing yours is because you all did really great last oh, time. Oh, yeah, sure. And, and so thank you for l listing your playbook. I'm going to borrow those for Brooklyn. Um, that's how we're going to beat you. Uh -huh. um, I'm saying that now on the record, and so I hope you're okay with, with coming in second uh, because Brooklyn's going to kick butt. Uh huh. We'll make it a challenge, council member, but it's, I'm glad it's, they it's were on. all working to get the New York City counted, which is most important, but I Amen. love working with you. No, I'm, I'm, I would look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I don't know if you I think no, we take that challenge too in the Bronx. <laughs> we take it very, <laughs> very well. personal, and so uh, uh -huh. we're on. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next panel, we're going to have Nick Higgins from the Brooklyn Public Library, Brian Bannon, Bannon from the New York Public uh, Library, and Nick Buron from Queens Public Library. Okay, so at this time, uh, we have, we're doing something unusual. We're going to have nine minutes. That's because you're going to be collaborating in your testimony together. And then after that, for everybody, uh, just want to let you know, as soon as this is over, we're going to be switching over to uh, the next room next door uh, because they're going to be setting up for an event here. You will begin. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the additional time. We'll if you could turn the mic on. Thank you. Thank you for the additional time. Uh, we'll try not to use all of the nine minutes. Um, my name is Brian Bannon. I'm the Maryland James Tisch. It's actually not a, just, I don't want to make him jealous, okay? Uh -huh. Not additional time. You got three, three, and three, but you're right. putting it all together. But we're still going to try not to use it all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm the, the James and Merrill, or the Maryland James Tisch, Tisch Director of the New York Public Library, and I'm joined today um, on the panel by um, Nick Byron from the, the Chief Librarian of Queens Public Library, and Nick Higgins, the Chief Librarian of Brooklyn Public Library. I want to thank the council speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, um, Chairs Cohen and uh, Cabrera and Machaca for uh, members of the committee uh, for holding this important hearing um, and for your support of our libraries. We'd also like to thank the, the uh, NYC Census Director, uh, Julie Menin, and the New York City Council members, uh, Rivera Machaca, for their uh, leadership and efforts. We'd also, uh, as part of our testimony today, we'll be talking about the role that libraries will be playing in the 2020 Census. Um, our three public library systems are, are essential in providing education and information to the more than 200 neighborhoods across our five boroughs. In fiscal year 19, the city's 217 libraries locations served more than 35 million in-person visits and, other, uh, and online uh, 46 million uh, visits. We uh, remain um, one of the most important uh, civic assets that our city has um, and enjoy high levels of trust across our city. And we think that's an important part um, of uh, leveraging libraries um, as we enter into the 2020 census. Um, the Brooklyn Public Library, Queens Public Library, New York Public Library have worked uh, very closely together to develop plans to build upon our strengths um, as commu community conveyors, uh, uh, public, our public computi computing centers, and of course, as noted before, uh, trust, trusted civic spaces in our neighborhoods. Our free uh, public computing centers and technology and internet access will be an important, more important than ever as we think about um, uh, uh, supporting census as being conducted primarily online. So there's a few elements of our uh, program that, that I'm going to introduce. My colleagues will talk about more deeply. The plan for 2020 census is comprehensive with the primary goals of connecting the city's uh, most hard to reach residents, providing technical resources, and of course, helping answer questions. In order to achieve these goals, our libraries plan to first provide targeted census training to over 1,000 public service staff members across our three library systems. We'll also hold dedicated technology uh, or add dedicated technology at locations um, in communities um, at risk of being undercounted, which it augments the existing technology that we already have, including census kiosks, mobile devices, and other uh, technology to ensure public access uh, to census online is made easy. 
We will also enhance our translation services to better communicate with hard to count populations. And finally, we'll work with our partners in government and community to provide targeted outreach in uh, specific neighborhoods. We're grateful to the City Council. Uh, the City has agreed to support uh, our efforts uh, with a $1. million in funding, and we look forward to working with you, um, the Mayor's Census Office, and key community stakeholders on this critical initiative. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Buren. I'm the Chief Librarian of the Queens Public Library. Before I speak on the Three Systems Plan for IT Data and Privacy, I would like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chairs Cabrera, Cohen, and Menchaca for giving us the opportunity to testify. The administration, especially Julian Menon and her staff, and the 2020 Census Task Force co-chairs, Councilmember Rivera and Menchaca, for their leadership and dedication. A complete count is a matter of equity and inclusion and as Queens Public Library serves the most diverse county in the nation, we, along with our tri -like colleagues, are committed to this collective effort to ensure that everyone in our city is represented, no matter who they are or where they come from. As part of this work, Queens Public Library, New York Public Library, and Brooklyn Public Library are taking immediate steps to serve as safe and secure digital access points for the 2020 Census self-response. Trili will provide dedicated tech devices to customers for census completion at branches, particularly in our hardest to count communities. These devices will be configured to limit access to only the official census website, preventing customers from visiting malicious URLs and clone sites looking to harvest personally identifiable information from customers. These devices will have secure, up-to-date web browsers and ports will have been disabled, preventing the installation of malware. Additionally, Trilight has implemented an automated security solution called Quad9 as part of the city's NYC Secure Initiative, which protects New Yorkers from malicious cyber attacks by leveraging the domain name system known as DNS to block known malicious and bad websites when accessed on our public Wi-Fi. This added layer of security complements existing spyware, malware, and firewall solutions currently implemented at all of our branches. No personal information is ever collected or stored on our public computers. In addition to enhanced IT infrastructure, the three systems will conduct trainings and programs for staff and customers around the threats and opportunities of a digital census. We will educate customers in an array of topics, why the census matters, digital privacy and security, and employment opportunities with the census. Based on recommendations from the Census Bureau, Trilight is aiming to provide a secure and private census experience. Staff will receive training on the privacy safeguards in place to protect respondents' data, and we will be available to assist and answer questions as always. Great. Thank you. My name is Nick Higgins. I'm the Chief Librarian of Brooklyn Public Library, and I also want to extend my thanks to the partners that I see in the room. Thank you so much for partnering in solidarity with libraries over the, uh, the census campaign, but also for other initiatives. Uh, NYC libraries are acutely aware of what's at stake in the 2020 census. Ten years ago, the city's response rate was less than 62 percent compared to the national average of 76 percent. In my home borough of Brooklyn, we have the lowest mail-in return rate of any U.S. county of more than 500,000 peop uh, 500, people. Um, the, the map there shows it. Um, another undercount in 2020 would have devastating consequences. Potential losses in political representation and billions in funding for public education, housing and health services, Medicaid, senior centers, libraries, and other critical infrastructure would be keenly felt by every New Yorker, particularly in communities that have historically been underrepresented. We are grateful that the city has recognized the important role libraries play in the lives of all New Yorkers by supporting our efforts in achieving a complete count. Libraries are anchors of educational, cultural, and civic life in each and every neighborhood across this great city. We have developed trusting and supportive relationships with generations of New Yorkers. We have developed trusting and uh, we, uh, we continue to build connections with our city's newest residents by offering services, programs, and collections in a variety of language, a, a variety of languages and across all ages. Libraries have worked hard to earn our place as one of the most trusted, trusted public institutions in our communities. Our commitment to our diverse and changing neighborhoods is never ending. The commitment is reflected in our services, our programs, policies, and collections. We are leveraging our staff, our infrastructure, both physical and technological, and our ex expertise about each New York City neighborhood to ensure that our communities come into our branches and complete their census forms. Our frontline staff across all NYC libraries will be trained to support census, uh, to support census takers. They will prepare to answer questions and provide assistance 
the language support as needed. Through community partnerships built over the years, we will amplify our message and reach the city's hardest to count residents in multiple languages. We're mobilizing to educate and inform our communities by removing barriers, fighting scams and misinformation, and improving access to the resources they will need to fulfill their civic duty. And regardless of what our current political climate may be signaling, inside the library, everyone is welcome. We're committed to being a trusted community partner that will be available to provide assistance to all New Yorkers looking to complete the census. The substantial support and trust we've received from our partners at the city census office will only help to reinforce the library's commitment to leveraging the full extent of our knowledge, tools, and resources to engage our communities in this critical count. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important topic. Uh, we remain available to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, I want to remind uh, the audience if there's anybody here who would like to testify, you need to fill out a slip with the Sergeant at Arms. Um, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, one of the prepared questions I have here was, uh, will libraries have space and staff dedicated specifically to assist people filling out their census forms? And I, I just want to supplement that though by, I'd like you to talk about you know, the, the outreach you've done at the branches to make sure the branch manager knows and the librarian knows, the people who actually work there so that, you know, whoever you encounter from libraries is going to be able to answer the questions and direct people to, to make, you know, give them the opportunity to fill out the census. So maybe I'll start. I, I think um, part of the training um, uh, that we're uh, putting in place is, is uh, roughly a thousand uh, public-facing um, staff across the system. So these are folks who are interacting with patrons every day or getting deep training. Um, we've already started the training process and we'll continue to do that. In addition, we're, we're augmenting. So you hope in, in your Queens, right? No, uh, NYPL. You're new. Yeah. You plan to train a, th a thousand employees uh, specifically on Correct. In addition to that, we're, you know, we're doing big communications. We're using um, our internal systems for, for messaging. So the idea is um, uh, our public services staff are, are already engaging regularly with the, with the public, and so we're looking at ways of helping them meaningfully integrate messaging into programs, you know, such as Story Hour, reminding folks about the census. Um, so even, these are staff who may not necessarily be assigned to just focus on census, but we're integrating census as key messaging and understanding sort of the, the, the important elements of it as part of their, their core programming across our portfolio. At Queens, um, we are coordinating our training efforts with our sister systems, um, following the city and the American Library Association census training guidelines. We are coordinating with our talent development um, group here at Queens um, Public Library with the goal that all of our staff, um, all over 1,000 people, will receive census training related, um, related information by the end of February of 2020. And similarly, Brooklyn, we're also um, incorporating the census, the messaging about the census, which is also very important in every single large-scale meeting that we have at the library. So all of our branch managers are supervisors of the library. It's all hands on deck for us. We have had trainings. We're coordinating our trainings with the regional census offices in Brooklyn. We've already conducted one for all uh, of our adult-serving uh, librarians at Brooklyn Public Library. And we'll continue to, as uh, Brian had mentioned, we're trying to infuse the message of the census into a broad range of programming that we offer at the library. So there's an opportunity to reach people if they're taking an English language class or a citizenship class or if they're uh, attending a, a story time for their, for their families. Uh, can you just uh, briefly, are there differences in terms of policy, in terms of using the technology at libraries that might be applicable to people who uh, want to fill out the census or particularly people who organize because I, I will just say and I realize it's very early in the process But my office helped try to coordinate a census job fair the other day and it took a little bit of you know We needed to email from you know from the branch to central central back to make sure everybody was on the same page To make sure that things worked smoothly uh, And it, it did all work out in the end, but it, it, I think that there there needs to make sure that if there's a policy difference you know, people are like, wait a minute, this is not the normal policy, we're doing something different. So making sure that staff knows that. Uh, yes, uh, we're, and we're aware of the specific issue that, that, that came up and, and I think it was a learning experience for us. Um, I think on the technology front, what we are also really focused on is 
um, the dedicated technology we're making available is not to require specialized login, et cetera, so that we can make it freely and openly available to anyone, essentially anonymously. And so, um, but yes, thank you for that reminder. Is that different, though, than what the normal experience would be? The, the current um, uh, way that you would use dedicated library computers is you would, you would log in using a library card and PIN number. Um, what the augmented technology is allowing for patrons to use the computers without signing in or logging in. Yeah, so I just think that we need to do a good job of making sure that everybody, that, this, you know, that things are not as usual. We're doing something different. So. Thank you. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to be sending, uh, uh, sending some questions because uh, time is eluding us here. And uh, so with that, we close this panel. Uh, please don't move uh, because uh, we cannot use the room next door. Uh, so the good news is that you get to stay, but uh, so we have until 4 o'clock. So I'm going to put the clock uh, to two minutes because I want to make sure we get it, everybody in. Okay, so please help me. Sometimes I have control of certain things. Sometimes I don't. Okay, that's one of those times. Melva Miller for ABNY. Uh, Kelly Percival, Brandon Center for Justice. Greta Byram from New York, from the New School. Uh, Meet Mita Anand uh, from the New York Immigration Coalition. And Perry Gross Grossman from NC NYCOU. All right. Yeah, if you could, uh, whoever's ready, even as the other ones come, if we could get, uh, we're going to ramp up. You're all experts in this. so I'm, I'm Sure, I'll confident. start. Thank you. Let's get it. <laughs> I like that. I like that leadership. Come on. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Melva Miller, and I am the Executive Vice President for the Association for a Better New York. Um, and on behalf of our Organizing and Action Committee for Census Work, as well as our membership, I want to thank you for allowing me to testify this afternoon. I'm here to represent our commitment to obtaining a accurate and fair count in 2020, and Abney's commitment to that. As many of you have already heard, the census is of significant importance and determines the allocation of more than $73 billion in federal funds just for New York State alone. These federal dollars fund programs that our most vulnerable New Yorkers rely on every day, including SNAP, CHIP, Medicare, Medicaid, and Section 8 vouchers for affordable housing, as much as we hear about the need of that for New York City. In 2010, New York City's response was less than 62 percent, while the national average was at 76 percent. This undercount includes many of our hard-to-count communities, including immigrants, communities of color, single mothers with children aged 0 to 5. Moreover, the upcoming census poses additional risk for all the things we heard about today, it being online, the aftermath of the citizenship question, and also the underfunded census, U.S. Census Bureau. In order to, make, uh, to ensure that we are able to make each and every New York account, uh, ABNY has undertaken a series of actions, including setting up and organizing an action committee made up of uh, city uh, leaders. Uh, we understand the challenges and barriers we must overcome when conducting this count, and we'll be hosting a conference next month, month on the strategies and tactics on how best to get out the count in upcoming census. We talked a lot about messaging today. What ABNY is doing is leveraging the private sector to get uh, professionals with expertise in marketing and outreach to help the city come up with a citywide strategy for communicating. After conducting a month-long needs assessment in 12 focus groups and engaging a wide variety, wow. Yes. Um, all right, so basically I have three asks, right? We want to, one, make sure that the money that goes to community-based organizations get those small niched community-based organizations that have the unique ability to get to the hard-to-count communities. Our second ask is to get the funding out ASAP. We have dealt with many, many organizations that have had to put staff on furlough because they've already been doing the work, but they don't have money to continue. And our third ask is really to make sure that we have a comprehensive 
public awareness strategy and get at the count campaign that leverages all city assets and use all of our resources to make sure that we are reaching every New Yorker in the way that we need to reach them. And what you just did there at the end is what I'm hoping everybody else would do. <laughs> Give me the suggestions. We know the challenges. If you could get, uh, that, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate that. No problem. Next. Hi, um, I'm Greta Byram. I'm the co-director of the Digital Equity Laboratory at the New School, and I want to speak about digital equity because um, the census is always an equity issue, but this time it's a digital equity issue. So others have mentioned that the census will be online for the first time. That means that 80%, not 60%, 80% of households will be asked to participate online or through the phone response system. Um, and that means that it's going, the count is going to prioritize well-connected neighborhoods, which happen to be mostly white and affluent. The, the barrier or the bar to digital participation is very high for particular communities, inc including communities of color, those with insecure housing, um, and elders. And so we really need to be thinking about digital inclusion and digital literacy as a key piece of the puzzle. And I'm so glad that libraries are um, on board to address those issues. Um, Scott Stringer's office, the comptroller's office, estimates that at least a third to a half of, of some New York City communities do not have broadband at home, so this is actually a quite a, a, a big problem. Um, so we also can anticipate that there will be risks um, in this census, and we advocate for a monitoring or a, or a um, to, to monitor the count, actually. Um, we know that there are risks with regard to, again, to online participation. There are also a lot of unanswered questions. There's only been one field test of the census. There were supposed to be three. I want to also say that Title 13, while it is ironclad as a piece of the statute, it is interpreted and enforced by the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is part of the executive branch, and Congress has the ability to change Title 13. Um, additionally, the executive order issued after the defeat of the citizenship question, um, after that Trump issued an executive order which allowed for data collection from other federal agencies including um, the Department of Homeland Security pertaining to citizenship status as well as uh, data collection from local and state agencies. So the data issues are a lot deeper than just the data that will be collected from census. So we advocate for um, what we've seen already coming from the libraries, um, which are the most secure and, and trustworthy uh, place for people to participate according to our research and we're just publishing right now a manual um, that some of the libraries will use to help prepare which includes schematics for how to build a dedicated and safe portal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. I'm Mita Anand, Census 2020 Senior Fellow at the New York Immigration Coalition, which also serves as the convener for New York Counts 2020, a statewide coalition of over 200 member organizations who work to ensure every New Yorker is counted. In this role, I've had the opportunity to work with many of members of the City Council and their staff, and with the staff of New York City Census 2020, as well as many of the citywide partners in this room, and we are working with ABNY towards having the Census Summit in November. In the spirit of uh, further collaboration, I wish to offer the following recommendations. First, increased overall coordination, including with the libraries. As we've heard, libraries are trusted resource centers within their communities and will have strong data access privilege uh, set up. Uh, New York City Census 2020 is working with them, but we would like the CBOs to have increased collaboration with them and have the libraries particularly working in terms of community-specific mobilization communications and data privacy. Secondly, we would like to see a creation of funding opportunities for smaller community-based organizations. Um, while we're awaiting the next round of grantees, we want to be able to partner sooner with smaller CBOs and see grants as low as $2,500. As, as Melva already pointed out, these local groups are the ones that are able to reach hard-to-count communities, and we want to see that those opportunities are created. Finally, we would like to call on the governor to immediately release the $20 million in census state funding. It is not just a question of upstate versus New York City. If New York State does not release the funding, it can help undo the work that we are all doing. It affects the representation of all of us, and it affects the federal funding that hits the state overall. Thank you. 
Go for it. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kelly Percival. I'm counsel with the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, we work to ensure that American democracy is responsive to the needs and desires of all people, um, and that's why we're interested in promoting a fair and accurate decennial mm -hmm. census. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks today on one particular threat facing the 2020 census, which has been mentioned today, which is the widespread fears that the federal government intends to use census data to harm census respondents. Um, I'd also like to talk about how we can leverage Title 13 to limit that threat. Um, so as we all know, um, concerns about the confidentiality of data are um, discouraging people from standing up to be counted in 2020. And these concerns are not shared equally. We know that communities of color are much more likely um, to be concerned about confidentiality. Many of these fears stem from the Trump administration's attempt to add a citizenship question from the, to the census, and also from the president's subsequent issuance of an executive order on citizenship data, um, which exacerbated already existing fears. So the city can play a central role in counteracting this climate of fear by undertaking a public public education campaign assuring affected populations that the information they provide on the census by law cannot be used against them. Uh, public messaging should include information about the ironclad laws that protect the confidenti confidentiality of census data. This Federal Census Act, or Title 13 of the U.S. Code, prohibits the Bureau from disclosing any personally identifiable information that it receives. Title 13 also makes it illegal for census data to be used for any non-statistical purpose, including um, immigration enforcement. It's also illegal for the Bureau to give census responses to other government agencies like ICE. These prohibitions apply equally to information that the Bureau collects using administrative records from other agencies, including any information on citizenship that the Bureau may collect pursu pursuant to the President's executive order on citizenship data. Title 13 is just one of the many laws that protect the confidentiality of census data, um, and I've included a comprehensive guide to census um, privacy laws in my written remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cabrera, Thank Chair you. Cohen. Uh, I'm Perry Grossman. I'm the senior staff attorney in the Voting Rights Project at the New York Civil Liberties Union. I was part of the litigation team uh, that defeated the citizenship question on the census. We took it from uh, 500 Pearl Street all the way up to the Supreme Court, and uh, very glad to have prevailed. That said, there is still a significant climate of fear, as others have noted. Um, you've got my written remarks, so I'm just going to keep it quick with a few points. Councilmember Cohen, you asked a question before about sampling. Sampling is not permitted on the decennial headcount. It is permitted and encouraged for all other census uh, products, like the American Community Survey, which is why it's so important that we get this headcount right, because the headcount is what matters here. Um, so to just Cut to sort of some of the recommendations. One, make the cost of participation as low as humanly possible. You know, make sure that everybody has easy access to not only the means of filling out and responding to the census, but also is constantly reminded about doing so, so it takes as little effort as possible from them. Uh, it's a lot like voting in that respect. The payoff feels very low and attenuated, so you've got to reduce the cost as much as possible to get people to participate. Um, Number two, rely as much as possible on trusted messengers. Um, they are the people who are going to get the hard to count populations able uh, to respond. Obviously, we have, um, you know, as, as everyone's discussed, significant um, low participation from communities of color, immigrant communities. We need to focus there. Third, when I go out and talk about the census, I get asked about privacy and confidentiality all the time. Um, there's been some discussion of that. You know, I'll say in addition to the criminal penalties that are out there, uh, you've got career professionals at the Census Bureau who take this stuff seriously and aren't about to start spreading it around. Um, you've also got disclosure avoidance uh, protocols and disclosure uh, review boards at the Census Bureau that are protecting privacy. People need to know their data is safe. And finally, I'm with me to encourage the governor to get that $20 million distributed as soon as humanly possible because April 1st is right around the corner and we need to get moving. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And with that, I got to move to the next uh, panel. Uh, we're going to have uh, Christine Budai, uh, Community Resources Exchange, George Hirsch, or Heish, uh, from Community Resource Exchange, Lemurai, Lemur, Lemuria. Did I say that right? All right. Uh, Alawadi from United Way of uh, New York City, 
Ben Weinberg from Citizens Union, and Marion Rand from Asian American Federation. Federation. And whoever is ready could begin. <laughs> you look ready. Go for right. it. No fear. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Shea. I'm a senior consultant at Community Resource Exchange. And I'm Christine Booty. I'm an associate consultant at Community Resource Exchange. On behalf of CRWE, we thank the Committees on Governmental Operations, Immigration and State, and Federal Legislation for holding this important oversight, hearing about our preparations for the 2020 Census. It is clear that collectively we all want to ensure a smooth, accurate, and responsible count, which will further strengthen our city, state, and nation. Community Resource Exchange, or CRE, is a Manhattan-based nonprofit that provides consulting services to the social sector organizations, we serve more than 500 organizations annually, both here in New York City and across the country. Last year alone, we worked with, strengthened, and advised hundreds of groups leading the charge on the important issues of today, from immigration rights, racial equity, health and education, to housing, hunger, and policy and advocacy. These groups provide crucial community-based services that are lifelines to New Yorkers. These organizations are trusted particularly by individuals living in communities that are traditionally undercounted in the census, high immigrant population, non-English speaking, vulnerable populations, people dealing with homelessness, and people living in illegally divided apartments. It has been vital for New York City and the state to invest significant resources in 2020 census effort and to work hand in hand with these nonprofits and we are grateful that $60 million have been committed by our state and city, including $40 million for our city alone to outreach and education efforts. So as CRE, we are currently developing training materials, including a resource guide to help CBOs support a complete citywide census count. Beginning later this fall, CRE will conduct a number of Census 101 trainings, focusing on why the census matters and how organizations can contribute to building awareness and education. And later, we will also hold a series of uh, Census 201 trainings to help organizations interested in doing outreach and activation work. These trainings will be open to any CBO, members of a local complete count committee, faith-based organizations, local libraries in a city, all will be free. Um, to find out more about these trainings, you can go onto our website um, and we'll be emailing the network for more details. Um, in conclusion, we cannot stress enough the importance of securing an accurate count. Uh, the census will impact, impact us for the next decade. Um, it will impact all kinds of funding and resources going to the nonprofit sector. And by in investing in the nonprofit sector at this time, um, it's critical um, and, and we are ready to support our partners in that effort. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka Cabrera and Cohen, uh, and distinguished members of the New York City Council. My name is Ben Weinberg, and I'm the Policy and Program Manager at Citizens Union. I'll try to make it as short as possible because of the lack of time and um, your great background material that covers many uh, things as well. Citizens Union also serves uh, on the steering committee of the statewide coalition, New York Council 2020. Uh, so we want to thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the unprecedented commi commitment that the City Council, the Speaker, and the Mayor have made toward the census, both um, your pledge of $40 million as well as your continued advocacy around the census, most recently to allow the hiring of non-citizens as temporary census workers. Um, it's really unparalleled in New York City history. Um, but we also want to mention that as much as the city has led on this issue, the state has failed to follow suit. Appointments were severely delayed to the State Complete Count Commission. The process took months uh, longer than expected. And although the commission has uh, already released a solid report, no concrete steps have been made to allocate the $20 million uh, we fought to secure. Um, therefore, our recommendations are as follows. First of all, urge Governor Cuomo and the New York State to allocate funds immediately. A sizable portion of those funds should be distributed to CBOs throughout the state, which are um, best suited to ensure that hard to communities are indeed counted. Other budget, budget allocations should be made 
uh, for census work by the state, including public education and outreach, uh, media buys, printing, mailings, etc. So we really urge you to put as much pressure as possible to ensure the census rises in importance among leadership in Albany. Uh, number two, embrace New York's nonprofit community, uh, already several hundred organizations have mobilized around the census, but to effectively harness the power of these groups, uh, we have to have clear and accurate information about what the city is planning to do and what resources it will provide, uh, just so the community groups will know where to fill in. And number three, I'll do it very shortly, plan and share information as quickly as possible. Uh, we all know that planning a successful outreach campaign takes time to design and produce materials, to recruit volunteers, uh, to establish connections, and the more time we take with it, uh, the harder it will be. So uh, we request um, basically to, <laughs> to do it as fast as possible. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. If you could turn the mic on, please. Thank you. The red light, the red button. Sorry, sorry. There you go. My name is Lemuria Alwodeo. I'm the Associate Vice President of Strength in NYC at the United Way of New York City. We thank the New York City Council for your support and investment in the city's nonprofit sector to help ensure a complete and accurate count in New York City during the 2020 Census. For 80 years, the United Way of New York City has worked to support vulnerable New Yorkers through out the five boroughs, our mission is to mobilize communities to break down barriers and build opportunities that improve the lives of low-income New Yorkers for the benefit of all. We partner with community-based organizations, schools, businesses, government agencies, and government agencies to address immediate and long-term needs around education and financial stability. We believe that supporting children and families with aligned interventions will accelerate academic achievement and progress towards self-sufficiency for those families and entire communities. United Way of New York City's involvement in the planning and implementation of the census is to, to ensure that there's a fair and accurate count for New Yorkers. One of our goals is to build the capacity of community-based organizations to engage hard-to-count populations across hard-to-count communities in New York City. Another goal is to drive alignment across multiple sectors who play a role in the 2020 Census. And our third goal is to increase civic engagement and strengthen local leadership in low-income communities and communities of color for the Census 2020 effort and for other future civic engagement efforts. United Way has collaborated with Hester Street Collaborative and the New York Immigration Coalition to develop a set of community asset maps for hard-to-count communities. These maps can be used as a resource by community-based organizations, government partners, and funders in planning and implementing their efforts in hard-to-reach communities. Several maps for Council Manic Districts 2, 9, 17, 28, 37, 38, and 49 have been shared with the Council and others are in development. Um, in conclusion, we want to thank the Council for their investment uh, to ensure a complete and accurate count, emphasizing the hardest to count populations across the city. We believe that investing in organizations that have the trust of hard to count populations was the right place, was the right place to start, and we thank you for your continued partnership. Thank you, I love that transition. Good afternoon, I am Mariam Roof with the Asian American Federation. Uh, the Federation is the only officially designated census information center by the U.S. Census Bureau focused on the Asian communities here in the Northeast. Asians are the fastest growing population in the city, growing from 1.17 million to 1.35 million from 2010 to 2018. To receive their fair share of resources, it's important that members of our communities fully participate in the 2020 census. We commend the City Council for paying attention to this. There are a few barriers. Um, actually, most of the barriers have already been addressed by folks and colleagues before me. Um, there are a few that I want to highlight that are very specific to the Asian American communities that we're working with. Uh, perceptions of the census indicate less than favorable uh, outcomes. Recent Census Bureau studies found that Asian Americans were the least likely race group to say they intend to participate in the census, with 55% of Asians surveyed planning to respond. The remaining 45 either do not plan to or aren't sure yet. The same survey found that Asians were more concerned data would be used against them and were less likely to say that census data actually mattered in their communities. This is further exacerbated by the legal fight around the citizenship question that most folks have already talked about. 
The, and the challenges are in addition to linguistic barriers faced by the majority of Asian folks who are limited English proficient. And that comes to two in five Asians across the state and almost half of Asians in the city being LEP. Um, trying to make this really short. In 2010, Asian male response rates in the city jumped from 63% in 2000 to 71% in 2010. Um, key differences between the two censuses were the Federation's outreach initiatives increased language support by the Census Bureau, targeted media buys in the Asian community, and Census Bureau's own paid media and partnership programs. The recommendations are similar to my colleagues, ensuring outreach gaps are addressed, making sure that pop-up centers are available, monitoring messaging to make sure it's consistent. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is um, directing the city's paid media funding towards language gaps in the Census Bureau, because even with eight new languages being added to, to online translated forms and paid media campaigns, none of the supported languages include the fastest growing Asian communities in New York, which happen to be South Asian. Um, specifically Nepali, Burmese, Indian, Bhutanese, Thai, Indonesian, and Pakistani. Because of the budget cuts, the Census Bureau has elected not to purchase any South Asian media ads, and so we encourage you to put some funding towards that. Indeed. Thank you so much, and right on point. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next panel, but we're taking note of everything that you're mentioning and your testimony. Make sure that, that we have it uh, so we can follow through. Uh, next uh, panel, Esmeralda Simmons and Lori Daniel Favors from Center for the Center Law uh, for, Just, for Social Justice, Susan Ashamari from the Arab American Family Support, Ariel Saransky from UJA, UJA Federation of New York, Antonio Alarcon from Make the Road New York, Jillian Free uh, from the YMCA of Credit New York, and we're gonna have six of them, so you're gonna be tightly together, Amy Torres from CPC. Chinese American Planning Council. And you can begin as soon as you're ready, whoever is first. I'm ready. ready. First. Go for it. Esmeralda Simmons, Center for Law and Social Justice, Medgravis College. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney. I've, this is my fourth census and considered to be an expert in this area. Our recommendation, and it's very serious recommendation, if legally possible, we'd like the city council to schedule a special budget amendment date early in November of 2019 solely for the purpose of passing the 2020, the Census 2020 appropriations. This single action will greatly speed up the appropriation disbursement process and will result in effective Census 2020 citywide outreach beginning in weeks rather than months. Basically, we have 136 days before the Census begins. And in that time, even though money has been awarded, None of that money has been dispersed to any of the grantees. And why is that? Because the money occurred after the regular budget passed and it occurred after the September budget amendments. So now we have to wait till the December budget amendments in order to get any of the funding that you have appropriated. We are grateful for the 40,000. We love what the city is trying to do, but this is gonna to be too little too late. In essence, I have 41, so I'm just going to go to the other recommendations. We also, I'm not going to repeat what's already been said about city agencies, but nobody has said anything about requiring and funding contract agencies for the city to work directly with their constituents. We urge major private entertainment sites like movie houses, skating rinks, bowl, bowling alleys, concert halls, the Barclays Center, etc. A Yankee Stadium to serve that with staffed pop-up centers. We already talked about um, media, but let's also talk about engaging New York's numerous and very diverse celebrities. Thank you. We have written testimony, also background testimony. We really, we really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Larry Daniel Favors, General Counsel at the Center for Law and Social Justice. I would just like to pick up on where my executive director left off. Our primary focus has been the needs to count African descendant New Yorkers, New Yorkers who are identified broadly racially as black, but who may identify as Ghanaian, Nigerian, Trinidadian, Puerto Rican, Dominican, so on and so forth. The reason we are explicit in this definition is because heretofore there is typically a brush over when it comes to looking at the black community um, as it pertains to the fact that that community is actually the least counted community throughout the five boroughs, particularly in the borough of Brooklyn. One of our primary concerns is the fact that as the least counted, equitable distribution of resources needs to be a commitment that is made both by this body and by all of the partners who are working to ensure the distribution of census dollars, particularly um, as one example, the Knox, which we think is a phenomenal idea. Um, but our concern is that if this program, which is a volunteer program, is going to rely on the needs of the black and brown community members, who are oftentimes the most economically strapped members of our New York City community, to actually fill in the services of a volunteer corps, that that is going to result in the inequitable distribution and sign up of volunteers. And we are hopeful that this body and that all of our strategic partners will be thinking about how to meet that gap when it does appear. We also want to be clear that there needs to be an intentional focus on pan-African communities, not as an aside, um, but as a group that is considered equitable, equitably included at the table. For example, while we are excited to hear about the re outreach to ethnic media, we note that even at the announcement the press release announcement in the press conference where this phenomenal funding opportunity and partnership with the city took place, there were no black press invited. So we are asking that as opposed to business as usual, where often the black community is sort of included in the people of color realm, that we be explicit and intentional about targeting those specific needs. We would also ask that as it pertains to the state distribution of funds, which we are clear this body is not able to direct, but we would ask that you would join your voice in calling upon the governor by perhaps passing a resolution or taking some other formal measure to encourage the distribution not just of those state funds, but that they be distributed to the community-based organizations which contain the trusted voices which the communities will actually adhere to. Thank you. One Impressive. <laughs> Impressive. You got but all that in. <laughs> I wanted to add one last thing. I actually serve on the state commission, so if you have any questions about their operation, I'll be happy to talk to them. Thank you. Thank you so good. Go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Ariel Sobranski and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. So as the council is aware, uh, UJA along with some of our other faith, faith partners, FPWA, Catholic Charities, COPO, and the Interfaith Center form the Interfaith Census 2020 Count Coalition. Our goal is to bring together faith leaders to raise awareness about the importance of the census and to support them in helping their community members complete the census. Uh, as Councilmember Perkins alluded to churches, uh, the faith leaders are really an important part of their communities and are going to be partners in getting the word out about the census. Uh, we have chosen to focus our efforts on 20 neighborhoods consisting of 32 census tracts and are working on building a toolkit for mobilization and launching an awareness and education campaign about the census. As Gil Brewer mentioned, this will include sermon notes. Uh, we have gained valuable insights from the faith communities who are really immersed in their communities and are trusted by their community members and present the following recommendations, a lot of which have already been mentioned, so I'll be very brief. Uh, from the city's testimony, it is clear that the knowledge base of these CBOs and faith leaders will be taken into account in developing messaging and deciding which media sources to use to disseminate information as well as in developing the Knox strategy. We would be happy to serve as a resource in those areas that overlap with the 245 neighborhoods in partnership and separate from the libraries. Uh, also, as Councilmember Menchaca mentioned, there is the language issue. Uh, it's really important to translate material in a culturally competent way as well as in the appropriate languages. Uh, we urge you to communicate directly with those in hard to count neighborhoods to, expanding, to expand existing translation and ensure CBOs and faith leaders are involved in this effort. Uh, lastly, Julie Men Menon mentioned that the city will be receiving real-time data uh, when the self-response rates for the census, and we urge you to think creatively about ways to open communication between the city uh, and faith and CBO partners to help direct resources to those undercounted areas. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Hi, right, good evening. My name is Susan Al-Shamari. I'm the Government Relations Specialist at the Arab American Family Support Center. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we have been strengthening immigrant and refugee families since 1994. We promote well-being, prevent violence, prepare families to learn, work, and succeed. 
Our organization serves all who are in need, but with over 25 years of experience, we have gained cultural and linguistic competency serving New York's growing Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities. These communi communities need people who know how to communicate to them linguistically and culturally, and they need people that they can trust to get out that count. So we propose and we encourage City Council to share a timely reimbursement plan for those who have received discretionary funds so that community-based organizations have the resources they need to do this critical and timely sensitive manner. We respectfully request that the city continue to include culturally and linguistically competent service providers like the Arab American Family Support Center in conversations around funding and resource allocation leading up to the census so that we can dedicate appropriate staff and resources for this critical initiative. We ask that the City Council advocate to the Census Bureau on behalf of the illiterate community members and those lacking digital access who will need direct support from the trusted organizations who can speak their language and is actually completing their forms, which they have indicated um, that is not allowed. So the Census Bureau, they're saying there's a regulation for organizations to help constituents fill out the forms, and we understand that that is around a data breach, but at the same time, our constituents trust us to be able to help them fill out the forms. So we ask that you advocate for that. Thank you so much for your time um, and letting us testify. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Jillian Free. I'm the Census Coordinator for the YMCA of Greater New York. Um, testifying today to share a little bit about who we are, what we're doing, and what we need. Uh, we are the YMC of Greater New York, and we serve over 24 YMC branches and 100 plus community sites. Many of our programs and branches directly engage with the communities often hardest to count, such as young children, immigrants, historically disenfranchised communities of color, and those with limited access to broadband internet. Ensuring the community members across the city are accurately counted is a way to safeguard the resources residents rely upon. And thus, we believe it is central to our wise mission. However, we do, um, or excuse me, we will be in implementing a citywide strategy which includes six targeted branches because we want to be focusing our limited resources effectively. Those six branches include Bed-Stuy, Flatbush, North Brooklyn, Jamaica, Flushing, and Rockaway. We will also be hosting community forums and we look forward to partnerships with many of those in the room. We are also engaging our new American Welcome Centers and Early Childhood Centers as those are places where people already trust vulnerable populations. We will also be hosting pop-up sites at our six target branches. And we are in numerous coalitions and complaint count committees across the city. But what we're here mostly today is to say what we need. We desperately need support with capacity and funding. Many of the CBOs that are here today, and what we have heard from those folks testifying, is that we're looking to CBOs to be critical in our outreach efforts. But if we look around the room, I think that we need more attention to how are CBOs' problems being heard and making sure that there's resources and capacity expansion. We need support with communications materials, and we need to know an agency's strategic plan and what the expectations for service con for providers in contract with these agencies. And with that, I thank you sincerely for all of your time and your commitment to the census. It is critical. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Antonio Alarcón. I am the census coordinator for Make the Road New York. Um, and just as my colleagues mentioned before, there's a lot of challenges that we have for the 2020 census. Uh, but in, tw in 2020, we have a chance to make uh, uh, to make sure that every New Yorker gets counted and get the funding that they deserve for schools, parks, uh, hospitals, etc. The process won't be easy, as many we, we know, many of those we represent and make the road are immigrants uh, from by a variety of statuses, including a large population of undocumented folks, uh, and many uh, with fear after the countless attacks that we had from the racist administration that we have in, Was in Washington, D.C. Uh, however, Make the Road is committed to implement and, and organize an effort to reach community members, particularly in hard-to-count 
uh, areas by providing the necessary education and outreach. In conjunction with the, our partners in city government and community organizations across the city, uh, we will launch a full pledge outreach effort. We have already begun, uh, began piloting uh, outreach in Queens and Staten Island, and we hope to begin the large scale outreach in these sites and, and Brooklyn as well. Uh, these efforts will include training and mobilization of our members across all sites, uh, leading organization wide uh, outreach splits and uh, launching a do uh, door to door um, and, um, and um, ca canvassing outreach. So, um, and just lastly, I think I, um, we me we've been mentioning a lot of like language access, uh, but something that we forget, I mean, um, even though we will, and, and Mictor will, will be targeting Latinx community, we need to think about also indigenous languages. Uh, so providing the translation for, for those folks that don't particularly speak Spanish, so uh, just the language access are across uh, the board. Uh, and again, thank you for the 40 million that we'll be allocating for, for the census average here in the city. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and members of the City Council. My name is Amy Torres. I'm the Director of Policy at CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is the nation's largest social services organization for Asian Americans, bridging social services to social change for over 60,000 low-income immigrant and Asian American and Pacific Islanders each year. Um, a number of my colleagues and our partners have already pointed out the urgency of the census, so I'm just going to jump quickly to um, the need within AAPI communities and then our recommendations. AAPIs were the fastest growing racial group nationally and in New York State between 2000 and 2010. Um, New York remains one of the top states for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, second only to California. And here in New York City, we, heard, we hold 70% of the total statewide population. And so this fast growth means that many of the AAPI New Yorkers that live here are least familiar with the census due to them being new and recent arrivals. Further, we also serve communities that hold a lot of holdover anxieties from repressive of regimes at home. Um, and then when paired with the anti-immigrant rhetoric at the federal level and hate crimes close, closer to home, um, we know that AAPIs are particularly unlikely to fill out the census, something that has been validated in the Census Bureau's own surveying of our communities where they found AAPIs amongst all other immigrant groups were least likely to be familiar or fill out the census and most likely to think it would be used against them. Um, so we sit at several different intersections. We know children zero to five are least likely to count. For Asian American children living in poverty, 96% of them live with an immigrant parent. So we know that undercount is likely. So we encourage an equitable distribution of the CUNY awards that are going out. Um, we know that over the past few years, the amount of funding for AAPI-led organizations has grown, but the number of those organiza organizations has shrunk. Um, we also urge that the council advocates for income waivers for temporary census jobs. We know that it's going to take people from the communities to drive the count in the communities, but if people are facing a benefits cliff, we uh, urge the council to do something similar as you've done with the SYEP program where they're um, that we would lobby at the state level for a waiver to remove any temporary census jobs from counting toward total income eligibility for programs like SNAP and TANF. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, 10 years that I've been here, I, I never had a panel this big. So you, you hold the trophy. <laughs> Seven. Uh, with that, the last but not least, uh, Parine Griffin, uh, Aniga Nawawi from, Muslim, uh, from the Muslim Community Network. Avi Greenstein from Borough Park Jewish Community Council, Sabrina Hargrave from Brooklyn Community Foundation, Juan Rosa or Ross, uh, Naleo Educational Fund, and Greg Waterman uh, from G1 Quantum. You could begin. If you could turn the mic on. Oh, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anika Nawabi. I'm the executive director of the Muslim Community Network, a civic education based, faith based organization uh, representing the Muslim community in New York City. I just quickly want to start off with a few facts. Muslims make up 
around 1.1% of the U.S. population and around 8 to 9% of the New York City population, which is around almost a million um, members in New York City. Uh, Muslims are also extremely diverse. They come from around 75 different countries and they make up every single ethnic group, African, Ameri African American, Black, White, Asian, and Latino. Muslims in New York City, 57% of New York City's food vending um, servicers are Muslim, and 40% of taxi drivers in our city are Muslim. And collectively, we have a buying power of around $17 billion contributing to New York City's economy on a yearly basis. By 2040, Muslims will replace Jews as the nation's second largest religious group uh, after Christians. So, so much to say that Muslims are an extremely growing population here in the city uh, and nationally as well. However, we are also facing a lot of barriers and in terms of the census count, uh, we uh, face a particular challenge which is around two issues, language barriers as one, given the breadth of diversity in the Muslim community. We ask city council to allocate funds and resources to ensure that uh, language access is available in Arabic, uh, South Asian languages, Bangladeshi, Urdu, Punjabi, uh, that can serve the Muslim community, as well as another challenge that the Muslims community face is surveillance. Um, although the Census Bureau employees are trained and obligated to maintain respondents' confidentiality, uh, the recent increase in negative political rhetoric, as well as government surveillance, post 9-11 uh, may impact Muslim response rates in 2020. So I want to see, we would like to recommend and advocate for the city council to ensure that surveillance issues, um, the travel ban, uh, all of those issues don't impact the Muslim vote and to trust community organizations like ours who encompass a diverse group of Muslims in the city to be the go-to organizations when it comes to reaching out to the community. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I forgot to mention mm -hmm. uh, the council member Espinal uh, uh, was joining us. He was here. And so I want to recognize him. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Hello, I'm Sabrina Hargrave. I'm here representing two different roles. I'm a program officer at the Brooklyn Community Foundation, and I'm also on the steering committee of the New York State Census Equity Fund. So I am the philanthropic representative today. Um, so the Brooklyn Community Foundation works within the hardest count county, hardest to count county. And we've partnered with Brooklyn Borough Hall to start the Brooklyn Complete Count Committee and have distributed over $100,000 to local CBOs to increase the count in 2020. As part of my work at the Census Equity Fund, we raised and are distributing over $3 million statewide. And the four local grant makers uh, band together to give away over $700,000 to local CBOs here in New York City. So as you can tell, our philanthropic efforts are not enough, and even with additional monies in New York City funding, critical gaps will remain, um, unless addressed rather quickly. Smaller CBOs, often working with hardest account pockets of our city, uh, may be largely left out of the current city granting cycle. These organizations are the most trusted and embedded in their communities, and grant limitations, including the three payment plan, uh, will exclude many from applying. Uh, borough halls have also been left out of funding and coordinating loop. Mm -hmm. And while census work has been occurring in Brooklyn, it re remains understaffed and without the financial resources to assist, to assist members of the complete count committee. Uh, lastly, I recognize that the knocks are planned, but it's November and we still don't know many details. Uh, we are afraid that there's unnecessary duplication of effort that will be happening as a result. And we need to be aware that it is November this week and it is getting cold outside and we need to start knocking um, as part of the knock effort. So um, things need to be happening ASAP. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Farane Griffith and I'm here as a resident for the Harlem community and I also serve as co-chair for outreach and organizing for New York Counts 2020. Uh, thank you for letting me testify today, um, chair and members of um, committee. Um, first, I wanted to speak about the lack of outreach in the Harlem community. As we know, um, Central Harlem is a hard-to-count community here in the borough of Manhattan, and it seems to not uh, be any outreach 
um, targeting that community. Um, through the Census Bureau itself, um, they've been very visible up in Harlem. They've been conducting presentations, job recruitment um, events, uh, which is only right because they are the um, administrators of the survey. However, we have learned to find out that enumerators that worked in the past for the Census Bureau haven't completed, census, haven't completed the census for their own households. So we want to know what internally is the Census Bureau going to do to make sure that their staff is also completing the survey. As um, far as the elected officials in the Harlem um, community, uh, they too have been doing job uh, recruitment. However, uh, there have been doing no public facing uh, messaging um, on the importance of residents in Harlem completing the um, upcoming 2020 census, given the fact that the data from the census will affect, the, uh, affect them in, as it pertains to the uh, redistricting process. Um, as the um, um, New York City Census Office, um, there's a lack of outreach in the Harlem community. On April 1st, um, Census Day of Action, um, for the countdown for 2020 and April 24th, census in your neighborhood, there was no train station stops from the city that was gonna be targeted for outreach. Out of the 13 train stations in central Harlem, which is a hard to count community, there, was, there were not one train station on their list to outreach into the community uh, with this new program that they're doing, um, which is totally unacceptable in a hard to count community. Um, the CBOs as trusted voices in the Harlem community, um, they haven't been able to do the, the, public fund, the public awareness that they need to do due to the lack of funding. And I just want to just close by saying that it seems that everybody's waiting to see what the city is going to do before they make their move. And I think the city's office is, is a year behind schedule when it comes to hard to count communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to Chairman Cabrera, Chairman Cohen, also Chairman Menchaca uh, for calling this important hearing. Uh, my name is Juan Rosa. I am the Northeast Director of Civic Engagement with Naleo Educational Fund. Uh, Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, has been having an office in New York for the last 23 years. Um, we have staff here in the city uh, working on naturalization services, uh, census outreach, and other areas of civic engagement. Um, uh, this past year, we launched Agase Contar, which means uh, uh, make, uh, make yourself count, and Asme Contar, make me count, um, which are our campaigns to drive uh, Latinos to participate in the 2020 census. And Naleo has vast experience working with census uh, from the year 2000 to earlier in 2019. Um, our CEO and other members of our staff have served on various advisory uh, roles, um, various advisory committees with the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and through that end, we've gained a lot of experience and, and expertise in uh, what, what works to get uh, people to reply to census. Our written testimony uh, contains a lot of uh, recommendations specifically based on uh, outreach to the Department of Education. Uh, research that we conducted last year showed that people who speak for the children or for schools um, are among the uh, key uh, messengers on census, the most trusted messengers for Latinos um, uh, in, in the nation. So we are, our testimony really concentrated on the Department of Education. Um, concretely, uh, the city right now has 247 uh, community schools, which are paired with community-based organizations that can be natural uh, champions of census. So our testimony today is really concentrated on how do we get schools and the school system uh, to be uh, prepared uh, for census outreach in 2020. Thank you. Good afternoon, Greg Waltman, uh, G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company. I'm just uh, following up with the council regarding uh, several proposals, obviously census-based um, issues similar, where you have the state kind of blocking up, I guess, what is it, $40 million, so their program can get started. Similarly, um, with respect to the border wall, superior bid was submitted um, for solar application, which would more than pay for the, the wall in itself in its first year of operation. Um, it's not only that, it's that energy is then exported for cheaper, not only stabilizing energy prices in the United States, but Mexico as well. And similarly, in reapplication, Guatemala, Israel, Palestine, and moving on to Yemen, Saudi Arabia, where you have walls that have been created out of animosity and 
division now having the opportunity to redirect the narrative and conversation around that. And as the city still has fiscal and budgetary gaps um, with respect to all sorts of different types of programs, you know, it's, it's only but appropriate now for the city council to address um, Attorney General James in the type of 28 CFR 5117 uh, legal context, uh, essentially advising on along the lines of special election so that Andrew Cuomo can see justice for not only the fraud that has been executed against my colleagues, but myself and the state representatives uh, along with him, the value-based um, construct can be held accountable in the proper judicial context. Um, I just want to reiterate to you that this is several months going on. The fiscal budgetary gaps that have been mentioned and discussed in quite length by the city council have still remain, and the contracts generated from this solution is a superior course of action, not only for the state of New York, but the United States in its totality. So as the thirst for social media and users, the, the fire inside of that, uh, the advent of that new innovation of social media, as that uh, seeks to unseat not only the United States hegemonically speaking, um, these superior courses of action still remain to reseat the United States as the global hegemon. So I just want to end at that, and I really appreciate you bringing this matter to the Attorney General, uh, his attention, so the matter can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you uh, for everyone uh, joining us today. I want to uh, thank our co-chairs, uh, Cohen and Menchaca, and also, as always, Council Member Yeager, the one that always stays to the very end, the one you can always count on. And I want to say to the CBLs, we heard you loud and clear. You need your funding. You need it right away. It needs to filtrate to the smaller organizations as well. It has to be as grassroots as possible. Thank you so much, and thank you you uh, for uh, bearing with us uh, today in the ma matter that we expedited this. And I want to thank also the staff for the great and wonderful work uh, that you uh, made it possible for this hearing to take place and as we move forward. And with that, we conclude today's hearing.